Remember to use your microphones when you speak for the benefit of the people at the meeting as well as the recording. A hearing room is available should anyone need to access it. Can I also remind everybody that this is a meeting which is being held in public, not a public meeting. We're not expecting any fire alarm tests today, so if the alarm does sound, we will leave the room through the emergency exits marked in the room. We'll do our best to avoid jargon and acronyms. But a glossary of terms is available on the Integrated Care Board website and if anyone would like a copy, please ask a member of team in the room. Questions from members of the public will be taken at the end of the meeting and any questions received in writing before the meeting will be prioritised. If time allows, we will then take questions from members of the public who are here in person and one of the team will make a roving microphone available at the time. I would like to advise members of the board that this is Ian Thomas's last meeting and I would like to welcome our new local authority participant, Mike Jackson. Welcome Mike, lovely to have you as part of the team. Also joining for the first time is Alyssa Chase Vilches. Welcome, Alyssa. Again, uh, welcome to the team. Our new Health Watch observer who has taken on the role from Liz Meribo. We've received apologies from Councillor Ruth Dombey, partner member, local authorities, London Borough of Sutton, and Dame Callie Palmer, and a partner member for specialised services. And with no further apologies, the meeting is corporate. Moving on to item two, declaration of interest. A register of declared interest is included in the pack of the papers. Members are asked to declare any additional interest not already on the register of declared interest included in the pack of papers and to declare any interest arising from the agendas or paper presented for the meeting today. Can I ask if there's any additional um, declared interest that anybody would like to flag at this stage? Thank you. The board should note the register of interest. Moving on to item three, minutes, action log and matters arising. Minutes and action arising from the IC being held on the 16th of November 2022. The minutes of the previous meeting are included for approval. Does everyone agree that they are an accurate reflection of the meeting? Thank you. Um, the, board, the board approves the minutes. The action log has also been updated to reflect the latest position on open actions, in particular relating to the long-term strategy for urgent and emergency care, where we will aim to bring an update to the board in May. Any other questions on the action log? Thank you. Moving on to item four, Chief Executive Officer's report. Sarah, can I ask you to speak to this item? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll take most of it as read. Uh, there is information in the report about the uh, COVID-19 uh, public inquiry and all of the organisations including South West London ICB are in a good place to be able to respond to that inquiry should that be necessary. Um, I know that all of our trusts and ourselves as the organisation that took over from the CCG have got all of the records that we need to inform the inquiry should that be needed. Um, on industrial action, so there are strikes going on today by the Royal College of Nursing, so today and tomorrow, and for us in South West London that is at St George's um, and HRCH and ourselves as the ICB, so those are the three organisations where the Royal College of Nursing are um, striking to both today and tomorrow um, and we have since the report was written heard that they have announced further dates on the 6th and 7th of February is my understanding and again those will actually include all of the uh, organisations so for us that would 
be those organisations I've listed plus the Royal Marsden um, at the next set of RCN strikes. Mm -hmm. And there are further strikes planned around London Ambulance Service as well. Um, can I just say that everyone has worked really hard to make sure that there has been safe services throughout industrial action and, um, and, and and particularly can I can I thank the unions and the union members particularly I mean the ambulance um, staff were actually coming off the picket line in order to ensure that we had safe services and we had a number of staff that actually went and supported the London Ambulance Service during their during their strike times and we will continue to provide mutual aid throughout strikes across <coughs> South West London so uh, so we will ensure that safe services Services are provided uh, throughout those times. Um, I will mention the ICB Joint Forward Plan. We are having to um, develop a, a five-year plan as an ICB that we will have to sign off. I'm going to ask for people's um, support in the fact that we have to get this done in a very short time scale at a time when it is very, very busy. But there will be lots of opportunity for us to review, update, amend as we go forward. I think that's really important. I was actually in a meeting with the national team yesterday where I asked could we get any further extensions on some of this because we want to make sure we engage with all of our partners on that process. Um, unfortunately it was set down in the legislation, the time scale, so we don't have a lot of um, flexibility on that. There is, There has been an extension for publication to June but it still involves quite a lot of um, work and engagement prior to the end of March when we've got to get the first draft out to people. So I'm asking for your forbearance on, on that and we will all work uh, quickly and, and carefully to try and get that into a place where we can uh, where we, where we can actually put that into the public domain. And then finally, um, I wanted to say we have an, in, you, you'll note in here we have an interim regional director in Helen Pettersson. My understanding is that the permanent post is going through a process at the moment, so we are waiting to hear an announcement on that, but no announcement has yet been made on a permanent appointment, but we are expecting that hopefully very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any questions or comments from a member of the board on uh, the Chief Executive's report? Thank you. The board notes the content of the report. Moving on to item five, a quality delivery system uh, 2022 uh, reporting. Could I ask Gloria, please, to talk to this item? Thank you. Well, I'm like, this is quickly to give you some overview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's one of those days, probably don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, um, in terms of um, quality um, delivery, which is the EDS2, is a, a public duty set on quality duties, a statutory duty of the ICB, and we all have to sort of fulfill that as part of the Arts Equality Act 2010. And one of the things that they've asked us to do, which normally before COVID, we will do, we will, they will give us some set of questions for us to answer. But this time, they've given us a tool called East EDS2, which is the Equity Delivery System 2. And what they want us to do is to benchmark ourselves against three domains. And the first domain is on any project we've done that is related to Core 20 plus 5. And as we remember, <laughs> Core 20 plus 5, we remember that in Southwest London last year, in terms of the adult Core 20 plus 5. And there are five clinical areas that Core 20 plus 5 covered. Um, um, hypertension, respiratory, um, maternity, cancer, and mental health. And what we've done with the one was to pick the one we feel that actually we've done a bit of more work on. So we picked maternity and mental health. And as you can see in, in page, um, page 20 of the paper, so 
we, we, we got in, we've got enough evidence to just assure you that we've, we've done a lot of work around equity in maternity. Plus, because maternity is the national focus at the minute, and with Embrace report that just come out, we've come down from five times more likely to die to four times more likely to die to 3.7 more likely to die in terms of um, black and white minority women versus um, now white counterparts. So we felt that would be a good one to actually look into in terms of our, our well being in Southwest London. And I'm glad to say we are doing very well. We have written a maternity equity and equality plan, which has gone to NHS England, and that has been signed up by NHS England in terms of our plan going forward. The second aspect that we that we pick in Dobi One is mental health, and we do have mental health cafe that is being done in Sutton. Again, that is a, is a pilot program at the minute, which in a way is about picking people that have mental health on time and actually then referring them to their proper service. So it's more or less using, looking at proactive approach, and it's a seven days a week service. Then domain two and three is about people and workforce. And in, in terms of uh, that, um, we've worked with the workforce um, department, we've worked with them to get some of those evidence. And in the paper we list, we've listed for you some of, um, some of the examples of, in terms of evidence that we have used. And we've also worked with Mercy from Quality and Oversight Committee point of view to actually review the paper and also to sort of like review samples of some of the evidence. So I'm going to pause there for any question around that. So what they want us to do is to score. We have to score ourselves. We have to rate ourselves as a board. And the, there are four areas they wanted us to rate ourselves as. Either as actually underdeveloped, developing, achieving, or um, excelling. However, that score, really they don't want us to, three people to sit in the room and do that. They want us to re involve many people. So that has gone out now into the system at like, a, into like a survey monkey. So we are waiting for feedback to come back. And once we get that, we'll come and update the board. But more importantly, we have to publish this by end of February. And that's why we use the opportunity to actually bring it here first. Thank you, uh, Gloria. So could I ask if there are any questions from members of the board on this? Mercy. Um, yes, I was, I was really interested to know about this 54 types of evidence. So um, uh, I was given access to, to it, which I regretted afterwards, of course. Um, so it, it's, it's um, qualitative and quantitative um, evidence. And um, so I note there's kind of a baseline and that we're obviously going to kind of be looking at improvements as, as we go along. Um, I was also kind of interested about um, why we, we chose um, the, the cafe and the, the maternity services. And as Gloria sort of says, uh, maternity is one of our core five um, plus, 20 plus. Um, and it was quite a key thing um, around diversity as well. So so it was a good one to, to choose, I think. Um, so yeah, so I'll be very interested to see what kind of progress we make. Thank you, Mercy, um, and good that you've taken a keen interest uh, in this. Um, so, Mark. Hi, I suppose just from a place perspective as well, that are, um, <clears throat> it's really interesting about this, the small commission services, that our local health and care plans are predominantly faced at inequalities, so that um, <clears throat> what I'd like the board to kind of be uh, assured of is there's a lot more than just the, the, the crisis cafe in Sutton, there's a lot of work going on in this domain at uh, their place. Thank you, Mark. Any further questions? So it's interesting that we've been asked to pick two areas and we've been able to pick them. What's the next stage after that? Because, you know, I would think we would need to assess most areas uh, against uh, EDS, but um, I'm not sure what the process is then. So this is the first time we've done this, I think, in this way. So great that we've managed to pick two areas, but it's, it's all the other stuff that we're not assessing, I suppose. My question is, how do we take that forward? So um, next year, They've told us. They've told us we're going to carry out. They're going to do this again, and they're going to increase the number of projects they want us to evidence in domain one. So this year they've only asked us for two. So it's going to be more next year. I, I guess um, 
it, what we are doing this year, because it's the first thing, it's like, it's like a baseline for us. And honestly, we'll probably be ranging between developing and achieving, but probably more tends to, towards developing from what we, from some of the re report results we've got so far. But honestly, it's the right place to be because the baseline is the first time. We're just then gonna work on it and build more on it um, next year. Also to say, with the Health Inequalities Fund, there are also opportunities there. We've just approved about 54 Health Inequalities projects across the piece. So then we will have a lot of evidence as well around the Health Inequalities next year. Thank you, Gloria. Jacqueline. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, thank you, Gloria. Um, I'm just a bit uh, more interested in the maternity one. Um, I was always disappointed with um, some of the reports that have come out about maternity because they've talked more about process and staff and not about culture. And culture equally of our staff also has an impact on um, health inequalities. And I'm wondering how we try and capture, rather than the doing things, the actual behavioural things that we we do um, and maternity particularly because I think that when you re dig into some of these reports actually behaviours is actually underneath and lack of teamwork actually the poor outcomes of patients or women uh, but I'm just wondering how we actually unpick some of the behavioural cultural elements of this. Thank you Jacqueline and I, I, know, I think we're going to talk more about that when we talk about the COCOP report because that is coming up at, in, in, in item, I think, number four. So that we're going to talk a lot about COCOP report and because that is where we're going to dig into maternity in terms of cultural behavior. I guess um, in terms of this element of it, it's more or less just concentrating on how do we decrease the number of mobility and mortality faced by people that are having protective characteristics across the piece in terms of equity. But the cultural bit that you're talking about, I think is a wider piece, and that will cover, that will cover on that COCOP report. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, so, Gloria, if I've correctly understood, I think you are providing us with assurance that you are taking the right steps to complete this in preparation for submission at the end of, the, of February, 28th of February. Um, you've outlined the additional information that you will need to include in that report, but I think you're asking us to sign off that you will submit that report on the 28th of February. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And um, with Mercy, working closely with us. Right, thank you. Is the board content uh, to proceed uh, in that way? Thank you. Moving on then to item six, Better Care Fund, Section 75s and ones with Section 256. Jonathan, I believe you will speak to this item. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, we're now into the eighth year of the uh, Better Care Fund and uh, this paper's for approval. It's actually coming quite late in the, the financial year. Uh, it relates to the 22-23 financial year. That reflects the rigour of local governance that takes place both in place and local authorities, including the support of uh, six health and wellbeing boards uh, to the uh, proposals set out here. It also reflects the expectation placed on us by NHS England in November that we needed to reflect on some additional uh, resource, the Adult uh, Social Care uh, Discharge Fund, an additional uh, £10 million going into the BCF, uh, the Better Care Fund, and get that signed off by uh, the end of this month. Uh, and just, just to remind people, uh, the Better Care Fund is a pooled resource uh, across health and social care to, to deliver the best services for our local populations. And it covers a, a vast array uh, of areas. It includes uh, a lot of support around step-down care from hospital and preventing people going into hospital in the first place, a large number of reablement services, equipment services so that people can get back in their homes in a quick and timely way. Uh, support for people with learning disabilities and mental health services to and also technology enabled services more and more uh, moving forward so there's a vast array um, of different uh, investments uh, and priorities set out in this total uh, pot of around 200 million pounds uh, that is set out here and funds approximately 
uh, 10% of adult social care across England at this point in uh, time across the country. So uh, I think there's a, a consensus that as we move into the, the forthcoming financial year, which this, this paper relates, as I say, to this one, but as we move into 23-24, uh, we'll need to reflect again with local authority uh, uh, colleagues and with health colleagues around this table uh, and review how we get the most of, out of this resource given all the collective challenges we face across the health and social care system that are, are, are writ very large at this uh, point in time. In terms of the detail of the paper, there is a national minimum expectation set about what health and social care should pool in relation to the Better Care Fund, uh, and that expectation is met, and in two boroughs it succeeded. In, in Sutton there's a, a small additional investment around older people's uh, services, and in Croydon it supports the Croydon Life uh, Project, the Living Independently for Everyone uh, program. Uh, of support which includes services around intermediate care, uh, rapid response and uh, equipment to keep people in, in their homes. In addition, uh, for the Borough of Wandsworth, uh, there's a separate uh, pooled uh, agreement which isn't in the Better Care Fund but covers joint working for between Wandsworth uh, Borough and the local NHS partners in, in Wandsworth Place around mental health, learning disabilities and autistic spectrum disorder services. Uh, and that is all set, also set out here for approval because it is a very similar, though not identical, uh, form of uh, legal arrangement between the two parties. So that's a brief summary, uh, Chair, of, of what's set out in the paper. Again, very happy to take questions. I'm sure other people will also be able to comment around the room if, if people have particular areas of interest and detail that relate to a particular uh, place. But really, this is um, uh, an agreement that we need to put in place uh, to fulfil our statutory responsibilities across health and social care for 22-23. And we're already looking forward to 23-24 and what the new arrangements need to look like. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Question. Members. Can I just add to it that we've also been advised of an additional 200 million that has come down for the, till the end of this financial year. Uh, that money I, um, is currently being used and signed off uh, to make sure that we make best use of that, particularly around um, pathways for discharge from hospital, which is uh, really important to us at the moment, particularly during this kind of winter phase. Um, that is non-recurrent, so we will get that till the end of March and that will not be uh, recurrent for the next financial year. However, the 500 um, million national funding, uh, that is confirmed next year as 600 million, and we have received the allocation, as have um, local authorities, for that. So that's part of the review. There is additional funding in that as well. It's not a huge amount, but there is additional funding in that as well as part of this review of the BCF going forwards. I think it's really important that we do review this. Often we haven't reviewed it, I think, and this is an important and quite a significant sum of money across South West London that we need to make sure is being best used for our local people. Thank you, Sarah. Jacqueline. It was sort of building on Sarah's point, which is how do we know we've actually, what we've invested in is actually making a difference? And uh, there's also, in, when you look down some, there are some where we've, we've over, we've put more money in than equally matched it. And I'm wondering if that's been, meant that we've had better services and therefore better impact in that. And we might not know that at the minute, but I think it just it sort of probably links into Sarah's point. Thank you, Jacqueline. Matthew. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on Jacqueline's point, I mean, the way we're doing that is we're in place looking at uh, the schemes that we've invested in and seeing if they've had the desired effect or not. It is early days, uh, I think it would be fair to say. Um, and with the new 200 that's come out, we're going through a process now to look at what we could do in addition that's different to that we've done already, um, uh, which we can then use as a bit of a compare and contrast uh, to see if those later schemes have been more successful or less successful and for what reason. So I think Jacqueline's point is a very good one. I think it's a bit early to sort of get through the whole process, but that's what we're going to be doing in court. Thank you. Uh, Mark. 
I suppose it's just to mirror it for both Merton and Wandsworth, but also just to call it um, uh, uh, Wise Wandsworth got a section 256 when no one else has. Um, and that is a historic arrangement. It was just to catch a kind of joint pooled budgets and joint pooled activity. Um, it is part of the kind of ongoing review. We will, we will fold that into the review of the BCFs. Thank you. Jonathan. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I just, just wanted to reflect on the, on the first part of what Sarah was saying, the adult social care discharge fund, the 10 million related to that, is in, the, in this paper, in the 200 million uh, that we as a system are spending. The, the other 200 million, just to avoid confusion, is a national pot that's just emerged where we will get something around just shy of 5 million for it. Uh, to cover those services that Sarah and Matthew have just been talking about, because we, we had two pots of 200 million, so I just wanted to be clear. But that allows me also to make the point that, and reiterate the point Sarah's made, that it is a really significant sum of money, and it's a point Jacqueline's also made, and we do need to reflect carefully after seven or eight years of in investment what's working really well and what needs some time for reflection and, and, and some thought again. That's a programme of work that I think, together with health and wellbeing boards, we'll be doing. Uh, over the coming months. Thank you. So um, I think you are asking the board to approve the 2022-23 section 75 agreement and values um, and the 2022-23 ones with section 256 adults agreement and values. And I think as a board, we're confirming that we are, we would like to see some further review um, of, the, of um, the impact of these uh, funding arrangements. So I think if we could bring that back to um, a future integrated care board, I think that would be helpful. Is the board content to approve on that basis? That's approved. Thank you. So, moving on to item seven, um, so local maternity and neonatal system uh, Kirkup update report. Um, Gloria, I think I'm coming to you, um, and we've uh, already had from Jacqueline a linked question on this, so it would be great if you could reflect on that in your introduction. Thank you. Thank you. The system is working now. Sorry about the last time. So, um, Kirkup reports. Um, Dr. B. Kokop was commissioned to undertake a, um, an, a review due to a lot of um, complaints and incidents that happened in East Kings. And the report was published on the 19th of October. The report identified um, four action areas. However, the key themes that came out of that report were failures of team working, which um, Jacqueline has alluded, alluded to, um, failure of professionalism, failure of compassion, failure, <coughs> um, failures to listen, failures after safety incidents, failure in the trust response, including the, at board level, action of regulators and missed opportunities. So those are the key teams that came out of that report. And like I said, there are four areas where they've asked every maternity in the UK to focus on in terms of benchmarking and, and probably really doing a deep dive into our, our own organizational culture is. And those four areas is about monitoring safety performance, and that is finding signals among noises, which I think that's one of the things, again, the culture comes into that as well. Standard of clinical behavior, that is technical, not enough. Flawed team working, pulling in different directions. Organizational behavior, looking good while doing wrong badly. I think that's the word um, Cockup has used in the report. So in Southwest London, we are still waiting for more national guidance in terms of some of the evidence we need to submit. We've done a lot with Okindin, Okindin 1, Okindin 2. Now it's about how do we then join everything together so that people won't be doing different things. At the same time, we, as much as all these reports are important, we don't want people to then lose focus in keeping an eye on safety and doing what is right in their unit. But some of those recommendations in the report, we've looked at it in Southwest London. As we are aware, local maternity system, local maternity and donator system is, is, um, was born after, um, after maternity review in 2015 um, by Julia Kubilic. That is that when they talk about maternity matters. And there, we, the, every system, every maternity was actually grouped into a system. And local maternity system is meant to have an oversight 
of what is going on in your local maternity, just like the ICS, but they started a bit earlier. So our local maternity system, after our Kindle um, re report, we divided ourselves into three sections, it was really looking at how we do things in a better way, not just having meetings. So there are three groups of people that work in the system at the minute. The first group look at insights, insight in terms of data, both intelligence, both soft and hard, hard data. We have involvement, involvement including this our um, patient, um, Women Voices Partnership across the system. So again, we have really strong one in Southwest London and every single organization of them in their system. And then we also have a group that looks at improvement. So anything we pick up from patient safety, any teams that we pick on, then we then work together as a, as a system to work on those um, learning and also ways of sharing best practice. So we've been working on that. And if you look at those four cock um, up action plan, honestly, those four areas can be grouped into these three elements, insights, involvement, and improvement. And I think going forward, that is how we're going to tackle some of this. And, I, and I've written in my, in my report, I think the one that is really difficult is that last one, which is the organizational behavior, looking good while doing badly. You don't know what you don't know. And I'm sure Sarah know I've said it several times. As much as Southwest Maternity Unit, they are, we are, they are really doing well. But honestly, you don't know what you don't know. And maternity, you can be outstanding today. Tomorrow, you can then go straight to inadequate. And that's just the nature of what is going on across the country at the minute. So definitely, the, world, the work around culture is really important. I'm not sure whether they've got it. I have to be honest with you. And I sit at the North and Middle Africa Council, mm -hmm. and it's the same thing everybody sees discussing across the whole country. And culture is the one that is different, is, and it's difficult, really difficult. They've developed some tools to help us in maternity, and that has been going on for a few years now. And actually, with the state of maternity, it's still really hard. Um, personally, being that that's my area of expertise, I understand it really well. It's a very volatile, volatile environment where decision has to be made suddenly like this. So there's that tendency that it becomes a silo service, that everybody just work in silo. And if you don't understand it very well, even the board, with all goodwill in the world, they can take any report to the board. But that won't dip into the culture of maternity. So I think we need to do more work uh, and also wait for this national guidance in terms of how they pull all the reports that are out and some of the evidences that they will need for us to actually be able to pull this. I think we probably will need to do a bit of more peer review, but peer review really going deep in and looking at culture. I know they've done maternity visits nationally into all the trust. Again, two days visit will not, they will not pick the cultural problems. And it's, it's really deep. So yeah, I think it's a big problem nationally. We are doing well in Southwest London. That doesn't mean we don't have problems because we've got a few whistle blowing across the piece going around. And uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Gloria. Any questions from the board? Jacqueline, would you like a follow-up? So I think one of the things um, for me is how, number one, how do we look at um, uh, the training of both obstetricians and midwives? Because actually we're not really training them together. And with the ethos of how midwives actually work about being sort of independent practitioners, uh, actually, it, it sometimes doesn't make a good bedfellow, therefore working with other clinicians, both of mid, mid, other midwives and, and obstetricians. So there's something for me about the training. There's the other bit about how do we know that our maternity units are being well led, both in terms of uh, the director or head of midwifery and the clinical director for ONG. And thirdly, there is that wider beat piece that, that got touched on, but I think we need, all of us who run matern maternal services need to think about is what sort of culture are we, are we actually setting in our organisation? Do we have psychological safety? It's something we talk about and we're open about and, and people feel safe to raise concerns, not just about working practices, but also about uh, when th things have happened, which they inevitably do because we're human. So I think, I think for me, there's a wider piece that we need to think about, about how we really get underneath the culture and leadership 
that I don't really, didn't really see in either Kirkup or Ockenden. But I think just through, um, and I'm sure my other chief exec colleagues who've all run maternity services in multiple organisations will know, is that it, 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 there is quite, there's quite a lot to do in there because the culture is so different from anywhere else in your hospital. And actually it needs constant gardening. But we also, uh, I also know, particularly with my George's experience, is if you don't have a good, strong head of midwifery who actually sets the culture, the behaviours and the tone and works collaboratively, then you're, you're, you're pretty scuppered, really. So I think for me, that, that is my, my question that I look at in my own organisations. And I think that might be something we'd like to pull this up a bit more to that. Glory in my... And I'm happy to talk to you about that. But it just feels like we need to get to some of the nitty-gritty bits of this. And... Um, and so it doesn't become a, and I know you don't want it to because I know you're really passionate about this. Uh, it doesn't become something that we've ticked. It's something that we do and we can see and we can smell and we can feel. Uh, thank you. I'm going to bring James in in a second, but uh, take chair's prerogative just to um, say I think I share the same sorts of concerns about this. And I think it would be helpful as we continue to look at this as a board to focus on those particular areas that both you and Gloria have highlighted around what are we doing to drive the culture change because that is absolutely critical the psychological safety freedom to speak up do people feel able to raise concerns because that is uh, key in both of those reports um, and I think is part of the culture that you want to create so that there's that learn, you know, approach to learning and the good relationships between the different specialists that exist within the maternity services. So I, I would just you know, reinforce uh, what you've said, Jacqueline. I, I think just building on Jacqueline's points, I mean, what's really struck me having you know, worked really closely with our team through its recent Ockenden visit and you know, we're obviously now very mindful of all the reports coming through in terms of Ockenden, in terms of Kirkup, in terms of uh, CNST compliance. Um, you know, very mindful of the fact that there's a, the, you know, there's quite a lot of CQC activity around maternity as well. It is how we, how we really support our directors of midwifery, clinical directors, and divisional medical directors to be, uh, to, to to be really robust and strong leaders in the context of the fact that they are now. Uh, themselves under a huge amount of scrutiny. They're expected to be able to talk to regulators, to be able to present externally. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple resort um, reports, you know, multiple exposure at board meetings are expected to have much more of a board presence as well um, in Ockenden. Uh, and I, I think we really need to think about how we build a cadre of leaders within maternity um, to reflect the fact that they are now working in, you know, more, uh, more than any other time that really exposed um, uh, environment where I think the leadership requirements on them have changed. They do need to build that psychological safety um, uh, within their service and they do need to be able to look down and, and work within their service, but they also need to be able to, to look up and out uh, and uh, to be able to respond to, the, the, to the, the sort of environment that we've now got around maternity. Thank you. Mercy. It, it strikes me as well that um, other opportunities, because obviously we're working across the system and there are many different hospitals, um, and surely as an ICB there are opportunities of learning from each other or, or at least, you know, kind of um, uh, challenging each other's culture in, in some way to, to make sure that we are getting underneath um, this. So um, I was just wondering, you know, where, where those opportunities might lie. Uh, and when we can do, because you're talking about kind of um, peer to peer, so it it might be within the system or outside the system uh, as well to do something like that. And I was wondering, you know, is much going on at the moment? Because obviously, you know, people, you you have this kind of um, uh, people working together anyway. But I wonder if people are still quite siloed in their own hospitals and stuff. And I, I suppose that's a question for the board as well. Thank you. I'll take John, uh, John's question and then Gloria, I'll come back to you to um, answer some of the questions that have been asked. So I, I don't want to hijack a maternity conversation with other services, but there might be something to think about and learn from the work in mental health around closed cultures. Because actually, if you change it, if you look at the Kirkup report through the language of closed cultures and mental health, it's the same issues. 
inward looking people, defensive, um, actually seeing the clients, the patients, the mothers, whatever like phrase you use as being kind of the enemy um, and that developing over a period of time. So um, maybe something, you know, an opportunity to have that conversation with Vanessa because we know what good looks like. One of the cautions or one of the worries I have is that NHS England are working on a set of metrics which will uh, give us early warning signs. Well, we've had a lot of metrics for a long time and actually what we're talking about here is fugitive knowledge which is around organisational behaviours and the culture. And I'm not convinced, having come from that provider background, that there is ever a suite of metrics which even with the benefit of hindsight will tell you that something going, is going off, which is why it comes back to the visibility of the leaders leading the service, I think. At uh, Dagmar. Sorry, Gloria. <laughs> Sorry, is it, is it me? Um, thanks. I also wanted to add that um, the focus obviously is on acute and the maternity in the hospital, but maternity care really needs to link to the community and it is often not the easiest to link up if we think about our early years integration, for example. Um, um, so, um, um, as we are looking at it, could we look at it holistically and um, in a way, train um, the leaders to also reach out and link um, with other professionals in the community. Thanks, Dagmar. Um, Matthew wants to come in as well, and then I will absolutely come to Gloria. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Ruth. Uh, so, I mean, I'd, I'd build on the comments made by uh, colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> for completeness and for openness, uh, I should probably just note that I was... Uh, involved in the Kirkup inquiry because I had a period as Chief Exec at East Kent, uh, so um, uh, worth board members being aware. Uh, <clears throat> so we've obviously looked at that um, uh, closely uh, in the Croydon context, uh, and I would share John's uh, point uh, very much, which is the first key thing here is about openness, uh, honesty, visibility and engagement. Um, it is sometimes a bit of an isolated space, maternity, both in the hospital and, as Dagmar says, out in the wider community. And I think if there's one thing that I would reflect back on is to make sure through these reports that we take the steer from these and make sure that there is proper engagement. Now, that comes from <clears throat> individual organisations first and foremost, but I'm with Mercy as well. I think some broader learning has some benefits. I think we need to just pitch what that's going to do and what only the ICB can do. Um, we don't want to be adding another layer that creates more work for pretty stretched people within maternity um, with a, another set of requirements from an ICB separate to those that we're creating ourselves. Um, but a bit about peer review and peer support uh, and learning between, I think, will have some merit because we have different maternity services in each of our patches reflective of the different populations that we serve and there will be some benefits from listening and <laughs> learning from each other and I'd certainly support an element of that happening. Thank you, Matthew. Gloria. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I'm just going to start with um, Jacqueline's um, comments. Training, I think, is crucial. And, and I think it's going to be evidence in the CNST that people are to struggle. And I'm sure, Chief Exec, if you've not signed, please look deeply into the lower, not the overall safety actions, please look down. They might be compliant, but there will be areas that they actually they are struggling with, and we are pushing back from the LMS. So training is one of them. And um, one of the things um, in Better Bats report is that people that work together must train together. And that is not just mid midwives and obstetricians, it includes anesthetics and neonatologists. And I think where the opportunity is, is, is the same training. That's the good thing about maternity. So it's about how do we then use the power of the system to actually then mix the culture a little bit, have maybe the whole system training together. I don't know whether that is possible. It might not be everything, but it's something that we might need to explore further. Uh, leadership is a big one. And honestly, sometimes head of midwifery especially comes from clinical level, probably as a good midwife, and then you get up to that leadership position. Not really have been prepared properly for other things. You'll be good clinically, have clinical integrity, but when we talk about actually leading and directing, it's a bit hard. So again, it's about what can we do collectively as a system to actually help our, not just the director of midwifery, the trial forums, in terms of leadership, 
and again maybe learning from other organizations like mental health, like um, John has rightly said. I think that external exposure has a long way to go, and organizations that have Head of Middlefield have had their, those external exposure. You can see that they actually they do well. So I totally agree with you in that sense. Then also building succession planning. Again, we found out that once those head of Middlefield retire, because they don't leave those jobs, once they retire, then to get somebody to step up is really hard because there are, there are just not enough people around. Nobody wants to be head of Middlefield anymore, by, by the way, with what is going on across the whole country. So again, it's about really planning ahead for us in Southwest London and building those future leaders that will be able to take those positions. And finally, in terms of culture, totally agree. Psychological safety is really important. And I think it's something that I think will make a difference. And again, if you do it as a system, not in our silo organization. And the reason why I'm saying that is that, like I said, maternity, most 99% of times we get it right. We have lovely bouncy baby crying, but sometimes things really, really go bad. And it's, you can go from one room by, whereby you have a live baby to another room where actually things are not really looking good. That emotional swing is really massive. And honestly, we talk about looking after our clients. I'm not hundred percent present sure how we do trauma-informed care for staff in maternity. They see a lot of trauma, and I don't think people understand it. It's not just about mortality. It's about mobility as well. When somebody just goes suddenly, somebody that is a bit normal. Yeah. So I think that psychological safety element, I think, is a big one that we might want to probably thrive, thrive on. Totally agree on in terms of maybe making ourselves vulnerable, probably bringing not just internal, inward looking, including external, external, externally bringing people in to look at us. Not waiting for CQC or NHS England to come and probably tell us what is wrong in our system. I think in terms of being more proactive will be really be important. What we want to do in the LMS is to really once we get the guidance that is coming from the NHS England, is to pull everything together, including the CNST, the CQC, everything together, and probably be able to then pick two or three things that we want to work together as a system. Obviously, individual organization, we have things that they want to work on. But I just want to be clear that we can't work on everything. It's a law. And if you focus on everything, we won't achieve anything. And I think that's the way I feel about, the, about this. And in terms of what we are learning now, we are learning. We have the LMNS. LMNS is everybody in the system. All the maternity units are represented in that. But what I would say to you is that if you go to your shop floor and ask the people on the shop floor and say, do you know what LMNS is? I'm telling you the shop floor midwife, like, what are you talking about? Again, it's about how do we strengthen them so that everybody is involved and people can actually engage. So I would just say there is so much in maternity, but I think what we might do, Ruth, we are writing, we are going to have assurance um, section in the, um, in the seminar session of this board where we're probably going to come back with. Hopefully by that time we'll have more guidance and more, more of the CQC results will have come out within the system. We can then bring, bring a bigger picture to a seminar and then maybe come back to the future board with some of the areas that we want to focus on as a system. And thank you, Gloria, and I think that would be uh, very helpful because I think as a board, I think this is something that we need to continue to seek assurance on and where I think we've identified a number of areas, and I agree that we need to prioritise, but we've agreed a number of areas that we really need to focus on, which are much more in, which are in the culture and behaviour space, psychological safety, openness, um, how do we learn from each other. Um, so I think it would be good to both have that seminar discussion and then come back as a, as a board with those uh, a clear set of proposals on how we uh, address some of those issues, taking into account um, Matthew's uh, reflection about how do we work ICB with providers so that we um, get the right level of engagement at, at both levels. Thank you. So, just for the minutes then, uh, is the board content to note uh, the report uh, from Gloria? Thank you. Moving on to item 8, patient safety incident response framework update. Gloria, I think it's you again. Patient <laughs> safety incident framework, and I'm going to try not to call it PISA because I would not to call it PISA. 
<laughs> so um, we all know that there is a new patient safety um, strategy that came that was sort of like written in 2021. Obviously, with COVID, we couldn't do much with it. And in 2022, they've actually pushed this ad for us to actually make sure that we can work on the strategy and implement some of the changes in that. And I'll quickly give, I'm not going to go through every bit of the report, but I'll give you an overview. This, um, the, the, the patient safety incident um, framework that is being proposed here is what we call SI in the past, serious incidents. And in the future, we won't be using that word serious incidents again. And now, if I probably quickly just elaborate a little bit, a little bit on this. In the in the past, we we'll get an incident. It goes through various governance, and then people do investigation. Investigation might take six months. It might take one year. Sometimes it doesn't even close. Sometimes we have incident that actually it's been still investigated for many years, and um, obviously learning at that point might not happen straight away. And you find out that there's bureaucracy and it has to be signed off. It has to go through layers or layers of approval before the report is being released. So what this new system is going to do is to call down all those bureaucracy and focus more on, on learning. How do we do investigation in a very um, concise way so that learning can occur quicker and probably can prevent recurrence of incidents? And more importantly, focusing on thematic review, thematic analysis, probably pulling what is going on in the system together. That is what this new system is going to do. And that is the, what they've asked us to implement in, in, across the country. And we in Southwest London, we've been doing a lot of work on this um, in terms of our readiness. The plan is that every organization in, in, the, in, the, in the UK um, implement I don't want to say PISA, but the framework, <laughs> we're so used to it, the framework by August next, of August this year. But we've taxed ourselves in Southwest London, we're going to try and do it in June. And then we're going to do a, sort of like a dry run around May. And that is just to pick any issues up before we actually go, um, go live. So it's a system that we're going to use. So instead of reporting on styles, they will report on this frame on this system, and we would then use the framework to probably then be able to put teams and trains, and also do immediate learning as soon as possible. We have started using it technically. If um, we we did have a sort of like incident in, on Christmas about a child death, and we want to try and probably use that methodology instead of sitting for 60 days waiting for. 80 days. It's about using this system to see how we can quickly draw learning out and start implementing changes. I will pause there for. Thank you, Gloria. Um, questions, James. Um, thanks very much. And um, it is something that I know is a, a you know a significant priority within all of the acutes in terms of looking at how we transition from what, as Gloria describes, is quite individual SI-focused system. Okay. Um, that, that's quite paperwork heavy to something that's much more about thematic learning. I think my question really is about how we then pick up that thematic learning from each organisation and, and use it to, and draw that into our thinking as an, uh, an integrated care board because there are definitely opportunities to learn about systemic challenges around patient safety and for them to inform our thinking about sustainability, about quality, about how we invest um, and allocate resources in a, as a system. And I, I think it'd be really interesting for us to have a discussion about, you know, how we get the best of what will be much more thematic analysis that we can, I, I think, use at a system level. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa. Thank you. There's a, thank you, Gloria. There's a real opportunity, isn't there, with this new framework to engage with our clinical staff in a different way. But also, I just wondered what work we were going to do with, as a system with our coroners, because actually it has significant implications for how they will receive our investigations as well. Thank you. Joe. Um, the other thing we're doing, and I guess it links to the previous item, we're also thinking about how we can use it to help shift the culture within our organisation. It's all sort of similar territory. Um, and we're also doing a piece of work around um, compassion and kindness within uh, Kingston Hospital and HRCH too. It's kind of a similar conversation. So we're using this as an opportunity to try and um, shift our thinking a little bit. That's really important. Thank you. Dagmar. Yeah, and again, um, um, similar themes that obviously the focus on learning and sharing learning 
um, needs to um, incorporate our partners. Um, um, that makes it so much more effective. And I'm just starting to really think through practically, Gloria, how we can um, share the new approach at place level in a really meaningful way so that people are not saying, oh, got another one of those, um, in, but that they feel um, um, and possibly using uh, some real examples to bring it to life. So something to consider. Thank you, Dagmar. Annette. Thank you. Um, thanks, Gloria. And, and it's, it seems like a really uh, improved approach to, to significant incidents and events. I noticed that it's not going to be used in primary care um, initially, but I wonder, you know, there will be times where primary care has been involved in patient care that then um, is, that patient is then involved in a, a significant uh, incident. And I wonder how uh, primary care will be brought in to those discussions uh, when it's appropriate. Thank you, Charlotte. I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about the patient engagement and feedback that's been involved in the implementation, um, perhaps not so much the policy, but how it will be rolled out, particularly as it's about kind of learning and improvement. Thank you, and Karen. Gloria, my question was around, it, so on the face it looks like a much better system, doesn't it? <clears throat> and it, in fact, you can extract the learning very quickly and make that change, that's got to be a positive thing. But I wondered how we were going to track the impact uh, and the improvement that we think this, this new process, this new toolkit will, will make. Thank you. Any further questions? No. Gloria, would you like to respond to those? Yeah, thank you. So, um, I'm going to start with the patient engagement one. So, one of the things that was um, put to us was we have to have what they call patient safety partners as part of this, because without them, we, it's not going to go anywhere. So, in Southwest London, we put out for two. We actually recruited two, but one person dropped off. So, we've actually got patient safety partners <coughs> in Southwest London working with us on this that has been employed to really work with us on this. Also, each of the organization now are in the process of recruiting one in their organization is mandated for everybody to do so. And I know Kingston have done this and they have somebody already working in that. We've written a letter that is going to all the voluntary organization at watch. I think it's with your team. They are just looking at it for us just to make sure we got the word is right. And in February, there's gonna be a workshop with um, service user local authority, um, voluntary organizations in terms of how we look at engagement and um, we will be working with your team as well in terms of that. Don't forget, it's, this is just the beginning. Um, implementation is around June, so we have a set of things that we have lined up that we're going to be working on in terms of making sure that it's, it's widely um, available and people are aware around the system. In, in terms of um, that, map, in terms of um, Working with partners, yes, really crucial. We can't do this without <coughs> partners. And um, I've, I've, I've been to the director of social care, adult social care meetings, where we have lined up us going there to present to them. We have also mentioned it to the independent chairs. And again, we have plans to go and present that to them. In terms of Vanessa, you'll be glad we've actually sort of like speak to a few coroners across the fudge, and they're going to invite us to their network meeting. I think there are about three of them that cover Southwest London. We've spoken to about two. Again, really engaging them. And I'll tell you now, that was an interesting conversation, because they are actually, the first thing is that what is ICS? They don't really understand how the system works. I have to say to you. It was a shock to us as well. So they want us to tell them more about the ICS and ICB. What do they do? And plus, what is, how this is going to impact them. So we'll be working closely with them as well. And, and I think in terms of impact measurement, in the framework, it's really clear on how they're going to measure each of the ICS in terms of implementation. So there are a set of things that we have to fulfill, and they're going to measure us against us as we go. And I think for ourselves as well, we know that in the old life, we, what we, the way we do things, we can always benchmark ourselves against what has changed and how well we are doing going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Could you just pick up the um, comments about primary care and also the thematic learning? I think the thematic learning is particularly important for us as an ICB because yes. that seems where, as a, as a board, we need to bring that back together. 
So all the patient safety, they, there's what they call patient safety specialists. Again, it's a new thing with, with the framework. And every organization around the table have one of them. They form, they form a network with, with, for themselves, and they've already started functioning. And one of the things they do, again, is to bring high-profile cases from that, from that area and actually then use that and start and do learning through that. With the, with the event that we have in December about the child, um, one of our incidents we had in December, we've used those channels actually to make sure that it goes to the organization quickly in terms of raising awareness around strip A. So those are already there in terms of how we really channel learning, just not within the ICD, but straight to the, um, to the organizations. And also to say we, have, we are developing a system called RADAR, RADAR system. And RADAR system will not just do incidents. It, they will do patient safety, they will do incident complaints, um, risk register and how we use that to triangulate and actually bring out more thematic review and we are working with Croydon. Our full brief is all going well. We are working with Croydon on how we actually make sure that works. So if that works, that will actually be preserve um, patient safety, patient experience, everything together in terms of triangulation and in terms of really bringing out thematic review across the piece. Primary care, yes. The first level, um, the first um, implementation said no primary care and also independent provider. It's just I think it's because of the scale. They want to concentrate on acute first, but it's coming to primary care. And honestly, I don't see any reason why you can't use it, the methodology if you want to or if there's any particular case that you want to use the methodology with. I know charities have been sort of like roadshow with everybody, including primary care. Sorry, Gloria, if I may, just very quickly. It's, it's, um, I think it's also just about informing primary care about this change. So there are times when we get involved with significant incidents that ha do happen in other parts of the health sector. And I think um, if that's being dealt with in a different way, I think it's important for primary care to understand that, even if they're not using that system themselves yet. Primary care is on the list in terms of the ratio. We have a long list of places that we're going to probably do ratio with. Thank you, Gloria. So um, on the basis of the comments and how they will be taken into account in the progressing this work, is the board content to note the new patient safety incident response framework in the report um, and be assured that the system has commenced preparation for this and the progress that has been made in the first three months? Thank you. Cool. Sarah, can I just say thank you to, to Gloria and the team. As you can hear from the presentations, there's a huge amount of work going on around the quality agenda at the moment. I know we finished the last kind of item on those things. Uh, and the team are working really hard with all of the providers who are also working hard because they're all implementing new systems around a lot of this. So I just wanted to thank the teams across South West London for all the work that's going on. This really important stuff, but huge amounts of work. Thank you. So we'll note the report and uh, also uh, thanks for the work of the team in terms of taking this forward. Thank you. Moving on to item nine, South West London Acute Provider Collaborative Update. And Jacqueline, I think we're coming to you. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, and thank you very much. Um, as you know, I'm Jacqueline Tostell, Chief Exec at Epsom Centre St George's, and I'm also the Lead Chief Exec for uh, the um, Acute Provider Collaborative. And we've got here around the table David Williams, who's also the Director of the APC on behalf of um, Epsom St Helia, St George's, Croydon and Kingston. So I'm presenting this on behalf of my colleagues and no doubt if there are any questions they'll also pitch you with some answers. The Acute Provider Collaborative was actually um, started approximately 10 years ago. So we were, we were quite early with this and um, initially started with uh, the South West London Elective Orthopaedic Centre which is based at Epsom uh, but also with uh, South West London Pathology. And over the course of that time, we've actually added uh, several more collaboratives and 15 networks, which David will just work through a little bit and tell you about some of the outcomes. And we take it, you've read the paper, and we know that we haven't got that much time because we could talk ad nauseum about it. Uh, but um, but uh, we'll, we'll just skim through the paper, the, the, some of this, and then we'll, between us, we'll answer the questions. Um, uh, it, it covers the whole of South West London, and I think when we talked about what we we'd um, start this conversation about, it was actually about collaboration and, um, and trust, because without collaboration and trust, actually, we wouldn't have got as far as we have got. And I think um, Matthew and um, Joe particularly wanted me to make sure that we mentioned that 
that actually this is as much about relationships as it is about anything else. So with that as a, as a base, uh, we've actually done quite a lot and, and hopefully we've done South West London and our patients and staff proud. But with that, I'm going to talk to ask David if he'll just, just uh, do some of the slides and then any questions. Welcome, David, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jacqueline, and thanks for the time on the, uh, on the agenda today. So you do have a, a presentation here, so I'm just going to pick out some highlights. But I think it is important to emphasise that the four trusts know that we can only improve care by working uh, together across uh, the trusts in South West London. You'll see evidence in um, corporate services where we have done this, the recruitment hub that's been up and running for a couple of years, um, and the procurement services and corporate services, moving on to radiology and pathology services across the patch, as well as elective and um, diagnostics care. And as Jacqueline says, the um, you know, the Orthopaedic Centre in Epsom, which, which uh, opened in 2004. Uh, so there's been a long history here of collaboration. Um, just to note, actually, the, um, that, that centre is some of the lowest weights of orthopaedics in the country uh, now, uh, which is testament to the, to the work that, that it's doing. Um, I just want to reference a couple of things. Um, firstly, the pathology programme. We're actually going live on a new IT and management system uh, next week. Uh, which will give us consistent and standardised processes right across the four trusts, which I think is really an exciting development. And radiology is coming on as well, um, so that um, you know we can view pictures right across right across the uh, southwest London as well, and our radiology teams can work together. So those are just two examples where we're we're driving both technology, modernisation, and standardisation together. Uh, I do want to touch on the work of the trusts uh, post-pandemic. Of course, that brought us together much more substantively in trying to manage this backlog of care that we faced for elective care, but also uh, access to diagnostics. And um, what you'll see here is that the mutual aid programs, over 2,000 patients in the last 12 months, have moved between trusts where we can sort of match capacity and where we've got scarce resources. And that has benefited us to reduce our, uh, our long waits. And I think that's testament to the collaboration work of all of the trusts in the, in the system. What you'll see here is some comparisons. So what I've put here is some comparisons of the long waits in southwest London compared to London and also nationally. And we do compare uh, really well. I just want to also reflect the work with Royal Marsden partners who work with us very closely on cancer as well uh, and the 62 weight numbers that you will see here um, in the pack. So we do have almost daily and weekly meetings together to manage that elective and diagnostic position with our ICS uh, colleagues as well. Now Jacqueline mentioned the um, 16 clinical networks. And these are really important and substantive for us as real drivers for change within individual specialties with clinicians, GPs and, and uh, secondary care clinicians working together, implementing best practice, creating efficient pathways and getting better access for patients. And they're the engine room of change, really, in, in terms of what we try and support as a as an, a, as an APC. Um, so you'll, you'll uh, see there some governance structures. So we have an APC board of chairs, chief execs that meets uh, once every two months. And we've implemented now an elective care board, which is jointly chaired by the APC and the ICS to look at cancer, elective and outpatient care as well. So that's coming on board. So uh, what about the future then? Well, we continue to drive reducing waiting lists for our patients and improving access to cancer and diagnostic care. That is our prime priority as an APC. Um, we're moving on to look at areas such as occupational health and pharmacy in terms of how we work together. And a, th a third area, we're working uh, with Helen and the team at the ICS uh, on a financial recovery strategy which will, will identify areas of collaboration where we need to work closely, uh, more closely together across the system for the future. So um, I, I've been here since, uh, since July, and uh, I have to say uh, what Jacqueline was saying about that culture of collaboration, it feeds down right through the chief execs to the individual organizations. And um, 
and yeah, we're looking forward to, to next year. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I have to take questions. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, questions from the board, please. Martin. Thank you, and thanks, Jacqueline and, and David. Um, you mentioned the, the financial recovery strategy that underpins all the work with, we're doing here. Um, is it possible to quantify that a bit and say a bit more about how, how, how important that is and how significant that financial recovery strategy needs to be in order to support all the other activities that are going on here? Yeah, well, this, this is a really important point for us as an ICS and the APC to um, lift our heads really and look at the underlying financial deficit position across the ICS and look at the areas where we can make further improvements, whether that's in looking at our clinical services or our corporate services across the patch. Um, and uh, we're kicking off that work. Uh, procurement has started to get partner in to do that work for us. So it is a substantive piece of strategy work for us all. And um, we are engaged in providing support to the ICS through the APC to make sure that that, uh, that follows through in the, next, in the next few months. Thank you. I'm just going to bring in Sarah and then Nicola. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, obviously we are in a very difficult, challenging financial situation. I think there's two parts to this, Martin. I think there's, and I think the APC has a role in both parts. So one part is around how do we ensure that we are as productive and efficient as we possibly can um, as individual organisations and make sure that we get absolutely the best value for all of our local people. And then the second part is what do we need to do together differently to actually make, again, our system more efficient and productive in what we do. I think the piece of work that we're going to procure is around that second part, around how do we work together, but it doesn't, it, you have to do both. We have to look at how are we more productive and efficient as individual organisations and how do we work together. So I think the APC has a role in both of those actually, in helping to support how we take that forward. And that's not just the acute provider collaborative, it's mental health, it's community, it's every part of the system. So, um, but I think it's important that it's a high priority for us all. Thank you, Sarah Nicola. Um, yeah, thank you. So, um, David, as you say, I think it's really, really important that our four trusts work together effectively. Um, and w what you've written in the report demonstrates really what a great start you've made. And um, I'm the primary care lead for South East London, and I chair one of the clinical networks that you're talking about. So I see this through a couple of different lenses, and um, and, I, and I see it. My experience is that this is really developing well. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about primary care in this, really, because um, the journey for many patients into and through and then out the acute trusts, you know, it, it, they land, in, they come from primary care, they land in primary care very often. Um, and you mentioned in your report about reducing referrals and um, changing how we um, arrange diagnostics, etc. So um, the pathway work that the clinical networks are doing, really important with that, obviously. So those pathways, those interfaces and those connections between the acute and primary care are really important for patient care. And um, I think our acutes can only deliver what they need to do in this very challenging environment if those pathways work really well. So I wonder if you could comment on what you think that, about the impact of that work on our very stretched primary care um, for example, where you're proposing or relying on primary care to deliver work that had been done in the acute setting in, in a different model, um, how, how can we make sure that that works properly? How can we make sure that, that work is deliverable in other settings? So thank you. I, look, that's, that's really important for us, and it's the reason, as you know, why the clinical networks are so crucial for us. It's about primary and secondary care clinicians working together on what is the best pathway for patients. And it is really important that this is not about shifting work from one place to another where there is not the support to do that. So uh, we need to understand collectively the challenges for primary care that we have uh, at the moment and how we can work that through with our colleagues. Um, I, I mean, I think the, the introduction of, of some digital tools, I think, is going to help us in terms of making those connections with patients much more substantive, uh, but also the connections between clinicians much easier. And um, that the, the outpatient space where we're trying to do that is going to be really important for us over the next couple of years. So, so I, I, I take your points, really. We can only do this together. 
and we can only do this by understanding the challenges of the different uh, uh, different parties in the system to work through what is sensible and what is right. Jacqueline, I think, wants to come in and then I'll bring other members in as well. So I think if we mapped many patient journeys, there would be lots of things that we got them to do or sent them or did with them that actually didn't actually help them get to the right place. So I think the importance of working with primary care is that bit, of, I hate to nick Tim Briggs's phrase, but getting it right first time for the patient and actually making sure we get them to the right place as quick as we can rather than long routes to get to the right place and then bouncing them between clinicians, which often happens. So I think for me, the, the pathway work is making sure that between primary and secondary care, we collectively agree the right place to get the patient at the right time between us. And actually, there's now, through the GERFT um, and model hospital stuff, there are national pathways now that I think um, we'd be daft not to start adopting because they're evidence-based and someone, someone, groups of clinicians, primary and secondary care, have come together to say that. So some of the work's been done for us, and I think the bit for us is how do we engage and actually implement them. Uh, but the bit for me is, uh, wherever you look in our system, our clinicians are... Um, at the end of the tether and actually making sure that patients are safe by doing this work together can actually only be a good thing and I think links into our productivity conversation as well. Thank you. So um, I'm now going to... May, may I, may I oh, just come back? Sorry, to go on, Nicola. So, so oh, very welcome, um, what you said, you know, and I absolutely agree with you, of course. Um, just one other aspect to it, really, is that sometimes patients have care in an acute setting, which really doesn't need to be there, and our acute clinicians would be better off focusing on doing something which needed their full expertise, i.e. doing work in other settings. And I think that is the other challenge, really, is to work out where that's best done, what that model looks like and then how we deliver that and how we can all work together to make that happen. Uh, I wouldn't disagree with you there and I think there are parts of our system that do do that and work uh, very uh, incredibly integrated. Um, the experience over the last few months uh, um, is that even when we have, so for example one of my organisations, Epsom St Helly, have an integrated care and frailty pathway, even and frailty service that's absolutely integrated with social and care and primary care, even when we have that, our consultants don't always know it's there. And that was a real learning bit for me over the Christmas time when we, we did some deep dives with patients. So there's something about how we really understand what's available in our systems, because I couldn't agree with you more, Nicola. Thank you. So I'm going to bring in Matthew, Dagmar, James and Karen, um, and then I'll uh, have, give you an opportunity, David and Jacqueline, to respond to any questions they have. Thanks, Chair. Um, you won't need to respond to mine because I'm just adding some extra points. Uh, so, David, you can relax for a second. Um, I, I mean, I, two or three key points for me. The, the first is reflecting on this compared to other places that I've worked of, which it's numerous. Um, I'd say the reason why this collaborative works better than others that I've been part of is largely because, I mean, they've talked about relationships and honesty and trust but it's because we want to make it work, as opposed to being told we have to make it work. And I think that is something we have to keep in our minds because provider collaboratives are now a thing uh, across the country. Um, uh, and <clears throat> there'll be some expectations, some rules, some requirements, all of which will be well-meaning, uh, but may not be absolutely what we want to do in the way that we want to do it. And our success has been built on us coming together and deciding to do things. Uh, and I think that's what we need to maintain. And certainly that's my intention. And that sort of links to my second point, which is what the APC is, is a collaboration between individual statutory organisations. It's not a thing in, of itself. It only exists because we've created it to, as a vehicle to do things that we can't do on our own. And I think, again, for the board members, it's important to have that in our minds, that this is not a, well, there's four providers and there's a fifth entity, which is the APC. The APC is merely a construction of what we have decided to be. And as you can see from the slides, we've done an awful lot of good work and we can do an awful lot more good work, I think, if we maintain that way of working, both in terms of our desire to do it and the way that we have constructed it. Um, and that's something that I think <clears throat> in South Australia we should we should work hard to protect um, and certainly we will and I'm sure uh, I'd hope uh, colleagues would as well. 
And then uh, the third piece uh, I'd say is there is a risk with this um, that you get a bunch of acute providers together. We're all of a type of personality, um, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> I have self-awareness of the difficulties, even if I can't do anything about it. But we are of a type of personality. And when you club together, that becomes a force for great good in many ways, as you can see. But people who are outside of that then can think, hang on a minute, well, there's this big bunch of people who've got lots of resources and lots of people, and they think they're now running the show. Um, uh, and what about mental health? And what about community services, of which I run? Um, uh, what about place, which half my brain is thinking about all the time? Uh, and what about primary care? Um, and there is something that I think we as the APC need to remember and be open about, that we are working all the time to not be the dominating, right, well, we've decided this is how it's going to be on whatever it is. And then because we're the acute providers, that will be so. Because I think that would be very unhelpful in general terms, but specifically as we now try to work much more as an integrated system across South West London. So I thought three important points to make. Thank you, Matthew. Dagmar. Hi, I um, um, wanted to um, comment a bit more. It does come across that this acute provider collaborative has an edge. I think there is some palpable leadership. I've also been around like a lot of other people. Um, where the club is just there because it has been told. Um, so there is this sense of identity and um, leadership and wanting to do things. And I think the, um, the evidence of what has been achieved is um, exciting. So obviously you can um, understand what I'm now saying. Um, prevention has to be also carried in acute. And if you're in a single acute trust and you have got lots on your plate, and then prevention comes and knocks at your door, you might just say, this is one too much. Um, but now you're a bit stronger. And obviously, um, some of you have come out and said, help us public health, we want to do it. We want a clinical strategy. How do we deal in acute with inequalities? We want to work with you on that. Because I think for this, it's good that you are a big force. <laughs> You know, um, there's strength in that. So that's the one, and I think as a system, um, particularly it's secondary prevention, it's not that I want you to all go native and leave the hospital. It is what can be done in the hospital. Um, um, we've seen um, at the moment with um, the morbidity and mortality, there is a lot of illness in this population as a leftover from COVID. And so secondary prevention is screaming out um, um, to be done. The other area where I think there is potential is the green agenda. Oof, you know, the NHS is now a green organization. Now there is lots of good stuff and you have got lots of enthusiastic clinicians. And I come from the, um, the health core benefits of your climate action. Sometimes even the green plants that I had a look at, they get so obsessed with decarbonizing, but I actually step back and a lot of the action could be widened and wow, some of our big public health risk factors all of a sudden start to tumble. So again, it's another area where uh, we are really keen to work with you. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I come back to the answers at the end, just to make best use of time? Thank you, uh, Jacqueline. So, uh, James. I'm a year back into the acute sector, having been out for a while, so perhaps I should take some feedback on whether I'm undergoing a personality shift. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think that the point that I just wanted to make was, in terms of the conversation we were having about um, uh, the, the role of primary care and the fact that we need whole pathway transformation to achieve many of the aims set out in this paper, particularly around elective care. I think it's worth just carrying that thought into the conversation we're about to have about business planning, because what's really important is that while we've got this really strong base within the APC and this whole, whole pathway clinical engagement, we need to make sure that we're putting in place the business rules and the, the, the financial flows that actually support taking that whole pathway view. So uh, it was just to, you know, I think really build on the conversation between Nicola and Jacqueline about how do we make sure that that we create the environment to get that change.
and then I'll come back um, to uh, respond to any of those points made. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been around a f good few years as well, and I would I would just say that I've seen the acceleration in the work that the APC does, and I wanted to just say congratulations because I saw it in its kind of well, that had been around for a while uh, in its infancy, really, and over the last five years, I think it's really accelerated. And in some of the previous reports that I've seen, certainly the impact of the clinical networks has been massive. Uh, and, and actually, you could have probably strengthened that here, because I do think they've been uh, huge. And you can see the impact on performance. So congratulations is my first thing, but there's a but, isn't there? Uh, so I suppose my question is, uh, the bit that I probably don't see accelerate as much um, is outpatient transformation. Uh, we know the work that's happening in London, uh, we know there's good practice. I know that clinical change is hugely, hugely difficult, but I wondered if you could just say a word on your plans to accelerate the outpatient transformation. Thank you. Gloria. I just want to echo what everybody has said in terms of the strength of the APC and actually having the chief execs really working together collaboratively. My question is on quality. How do we really not just focus on performance and number of activities? How do we then change that focus in terms of quality? And I'm looking at maybe building quality improvements into everything that we do. So please, it's, it's just a plea in terms of please think about quality and how do we include quality improvement into the plans? Uh, thank you. So Jacqueline, if I come back to you. I might, I might ask Joe to talk about outpatients because he leads on that on our behalf. I was looking at him, trying to catch his eye and go, you know, but anyway. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so public health included. I, I, think you, I think you're right, and we'd love to, part of it, and I'm, I'm sure I speak for all of us, particularly as both Matthew and Joe are place-based leaders as well, is actually how do we entwine that with it? Because I think we're all of the view that unless we really have a strong public health that goes back to us being part of that, then we will keep getting what we've currently got and we think we can all do better on that. So Dagmar, happy to talk to you about how we might think about how we weave that through this. Um, the Green Agenda, well, um, I know that one of the Georgie's anaesthetists is, is actually the, the clinical lead for the ICS in regard to the Green Plan. And that I know that um, there is a huge amount of focus on things that have nothing to do with decarbonisation. So, you know, removing isofluorane for, out, of our, out of our anaesthetic rooms. Uh, I think most of our organisations have, if they've not done that, they're well on the way to doing that. Moving away from single-use plastics. There's quite a lot we have done, both recycling, reducing things that we pop into the air through our through multiple theatres, trying not to keep using things that we only use once but go go back to probably where we were 10 years ago actually but actually that's the right thing to do and as long as the quality of, of um, um, is good in terms of cleaning of those instruments for example uh, we're moving back to less disposable gowns so there's a load that we are doing to try and reduce the impact on the and I think we're all roughly in the same place and I think uh, I don't know who leads on for Sarah on the green agenda but that is that, is, I'm sure you could talk about more, but we are all individually and collectively quite part of that. Although we don't use it in the APC, it's part of the ICS, I would say, and our individual boards are, I know mine are hot on it every time we meet. Um, uh, just in terms of quality improvement, we do try and use quality improvement methodology. What we don't have um, is... And I think it's because we leave it more to the individual organisations than we do collectively. And we've talked periodically about, do we bring together some of the quality things? And we haven't, we've never quite landed it, and partly probably because there's always been a huge amount of other stuff to do. But one of my colleagues might want to have a different view on that. But it, it, you know, we do quality in so many other places. I think we just felt it was probably another step too far because we're relying on our individual boards to oversee some of that. There is some bits of quality we look at in, our, in a particularly part of the clinical networks. And if James Marsh was here, who's the SRO, Dr. James Marsh of the clinical networks, he might be able to talk more about that. But we, do, we don't have a quality dashboard or anything, but we do use QI methodology in what we're trying to do. And particularly, we like our SPC charts very much. Um, so I hope that answers that. And I'll just, if that's okay, Chair, that I asked Joe just to talk about outpatient, because I think we'd agree with you. Yeah, um, so it's quite a lot we're doing um, around outpatients, Karen. So we've, we've um, had a programme of work now, which I co-chair with both a primary care and a secondary care clinical lead. Um, we've got a small number of priorities that we're focusing on. 
I think my reflection is we've sort of moved over the course of this year from kind of working as individual organisations and trying to be as good as we can be to now thinking more about how we can support each other improve. Um, so I think there's more to do um, in that space. We're revamping the sort of engine room that's driving the programme. So I'm hoping um, as of now we're going to start picking up the, the pace and all of that. Um, I think it's also worth um, just highlighting a couple of other things. So we're, we're thinking about how we can use the outpatient program to address inequalities. So I had a conversation with Kevin Fenton, who's the London um, Regional Director of Public Health, to get his view of how you might, you know, take an approach that would help us address the inequalities that lie across South West London vis-a-vis -vis outpatient appointments. So we're going to build that into our approach. I think also on the, the green agenda, clearly outpatient activity, any appointments that require people to come into hospitals multiple times, sometimes unnecessarily contributes to our um, environmental impacts. I think there's something in there for us which we are having conversations about. And then I think on the preventative bit, I'd agree with what's been said, opportunity for the APC to do stuff. But it's also quite a local conversation as well. Um, and we have you know, in-depth conversations about how we can do more as secondary care providers, as anchor institutions, to really shift resources and think about that preventative agenda. I think I talked about that last time, but they're very much conversations that are um, alive and thriving within the boroughs that we operate. And I know there's more I'm sure we could do as an APC on that as well. Thank you, Joe. So um, I think John and Sarah want to come in. Can we keep the comments very brief, please? And then I'll sum up. So just to say, having come from somewhere else in the country, actually observing the APC close up, uh, I think um, it's a pretty spectacular program in place. And I think one of the reasons for that is the significant investment that's gone in to, to support clinicians, particularly from primary care, working with other, that APC environment. I suppose the one thought that's going through my mind with the winds of change coming through the NHS and the tightening fiscal budgets, how we make sure we don't fall into the trap of attempting to boil the ocean and how we think about what the key priorities are at each clinical network or you know, how we think about that going forward because I think there is the danger that it'll be all things to all people and we cannot boil that ocean irrespective of how much resource we put into it. So I think you know, that's the conversation we need to be honest with ourselves about going forward. Thank you, Sarah. So just really briefly, so, so I would just like to say Integrated Care Board, the integrated for the NHS is about how do we integrate our organisations across the NHS as well as how do we work in an integrated way with lo local government. And I think we, ha we are very lucky actually in South West London that we've got the APC, we've also got successful mental health collaborative and successful cancer collaboratives. So uh, I think we need to recognise that and say thank you for that and the, the integrated. There are a number of other things that will be coming back to the board. So we will be bringing an update from mental health, from cancer and also on the green agenda because we do have a green plan for South West London as well which we will be bringing but I just think you know the, the the success of us as an integrated care board relies very much on the success of the systems and the, the collaborations within South West London which obviously this is one and a very successful one so I just thought it was important to say that. Yeah thank you um, and I think as a board uh, absolutely key to note the very positive reflections that people have had on the collaboration that exists uh, here so thank you as well as some of the self-reflection on <laughs> what more do we need to do across the system um, uh, and to focus on different aspects of the work um, and the continued development. So thank you very much for all of the work that you've done collectively on this. Is the board content to note the priorities, achievements, governments and development of the APC and support the continued development of it? Thank you. Um, and on that note, we'll take a short break. Um, so could I have everybody back at half past 11, please? So a 10 minute break. <laughs> it's freezing in here, isn't it?
Thank you, everyone. So um, I am conscious that we are running five minutes behind uh, agenda at this point. So I'd be grateful if we could just take that into account as people are contributing over the next few items. So if I could come to item 10, which is a winter update. And Jonathan, you're to speak to this item. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Thank you for that. And uh, I think at the end, Matthew uh, Kershaw will also join and give a, a bit more flavour of, of uh, where we are at this point in time. Of course, it's been a hugely challenging time for the NHS over this winter period. You don't need me to that, tell you that. Anyone in the room uh, will know that from the cover of any uh, newspaper at this, this point in time. But I, I'm really going to talk through about where we are at now um, uh, as well as a little bit of the context around the pressures that were experienced in, in, in December uh, and January, which people will remember particularly well with the, with the challenges around uh, Strep A um, that we experienced, the pressures of COVID uh, and flu that the NHS uh, has been uh, working through over the recent uh, couple of months. In many ways, I think, with, with subtle nuance and difference, it's felt as challenging as any part of the COVID pandemic uh, for uh, many uh, local parts of the system, be that in primary, secondary care, social care, um, integrated urgent care, um, all facing immense pressures at this uh, point, point in time. Having said that, we have seen some improvement over the last uh, couple of weeks in, in the position, so that's uh, pleasing to, to report to the board. To give you an example of that, whilst any patient waiting over 60 minutes back of an ambulance is one too long, uh, the week ending of the 1st of January, 25% of patients in South West London were waiting over 60 minutes. That's now 10% of patients, so that's improved significantly in the last two weeks. We've also seen a significant improvement in the performance against the four-hour standard, which is up to 75.5%, where um, just a couple of weeks ago it was down at 69%. So we have started to see um, some stabilising in the position after some, a very challenging uh, period of time. Having said that, I would say it is immensely fragile. Uh, the cold weather that we're currently experiencing, we know the impact that will have in a week or so from a respiratory uh, conditions point of view. And of course, the industrial action that people have talked about earlier will also um, uh, potentially have an impact going forward. And it's also worth um, the board being aware of the intense uh, scrutiny attached that you would expect through um, our regulators and through uh, the Department of Health around uh, our urgent emergency care performance this moment. We spent a lot of time last week planning for both elective and non-elective care exactly what our capacity looked like for the next uh, three months uh, and providing a very detailed uh, response around that. So there's a great deal of external scrutiny of what we're doing, quite rightly, in the context of the scale of the challenges uh, we face, as well as our own internal scrutiny. Um, people will also be aware, uh, because this was in the press, about uh, conversations with the London Ambulance Service about handing patients over within a 45-minute time frame um, and what would happen uh, once that timeline was passed. We've been working closely across South London uh, to think about how we can make this work most effectively for patients in our uh, patch and we've agreed with um, London Ambulance Service that the, the maximum number of patients were handed over in any 20 minute period under the, the terms of that arrangement will be one, so three per hour. Uh, we're working to, uh, with CCAM, the uh, South East Coast Ambulance Service as well, to uh, achieve a similar arrangement for them going forward. And just on the 111 service, that's had a very challenging uh, period too with immense variability in demand. If you rang them yesterday, your call would have been picked up within one second. If you rang at the height of the strep A curve, it would have been an hour. So to give you some idea of the, the um, uh, pressures on the system. And I also want to uh, call out the work that we've done with the community and voluntary sector as well. I know there's some very specific pieces of work we've done with uh, Merton, um, 
and colleagues in Croydon uh, too, to try and target our support um, and using community pharmacy, using 111 and using the voluntary community sector to target vulnerable groups and provide support to uh, uh, particular communities at this, at this challenging time. So that's a sort of bit of an operational update on where we are. To, just to highlight, as you remember, back in September, as a board, we signed off £13 million worth of um, investment to deliver additional capacity uh, in our system through this winter. I'm pleased to report against the 60 physical beds that we plan to put in, uh, sorry, against the 52 uh, physical beds we plan to put in place, we've achieved uh, 60 at this point in time, and against the bed equivalent uh, capacity where we expected to have 90 in January 23, we're at 98. In addition, we made the decision um, also in the autumn to invest further in the South West London Bed Bureau, so additional care home support and capacity that people remember, and that's brought another 38 uh, uh, care home beds on stream and 11 uh, beds for patients who have uh, COVID symptoms as well. And in addition, we're just uh, in this week uh, firing up re additional resources on the back of some of the money that we mentioned earlier at this meeting to provide another 17 beds through the uh, Bed Bureau. So there's significant additional capacity in place and that is actually tracking against um, our plan uh, at this point in the year. As we've said, there's the Adult Social Care Fund, so that's the additional 200 million across the system, focused on purchasing more packages of care uh, and for patients and, and providing support in care homes and increasing social care uh, support um, and support to staff around discharge and also support to mental health patients around discharge uh, too. There's the 200 million to buy uh, short-term care placements uh, that Sarah mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, and that's to fund for up to four weeks of bed capacity to support discharge for patients who no longer meet the criteria to reside uh, model. Um, and our allocation of that is around £5 million, and we'll be using some of that to support things like the bed bureau piece, but also to support what we're doing around virtual wards at this point in time uh, to increase that to a 24 uh, seven uh, service consistently across um, the patch. Uh, virtual wards are a relatively new initiative and there's more we need to do there. We're working with acute medical directors to increase confidence and collective clinical awareness between across primary and secondary care about what the right patients are to be in those services and in reach so that uh, people are able to uh, pull to patients into those services in a much more um, timely way. So we optimise the use of, uh, uh, of the virtual wards capacity going forward, as well as working with primary and secondary care clinicians on additional clinical pathways for things like falls and delirium and heart failure to broaden the scope of what the virtual ward uh, can treat. And the final uh, pot of additional money um, that's been announced nationally is around discharge lounges. So um, colleagues across the system and thank you for the very rapid response on this, have supported us around additional um, discharge lounge uh, capacity and proposals that we put in to NHS England on that. So the second area of the update, as I say, was the additional investment and how we're delivering that, and we're largely delivering against our plan. And then the third area, and I'll stop then after that, uh, Chair, was um, given how challenges it's been at the beginning of this year and the very end of last year, We've been working through the Urgent Emergency Board that Matthew and I co-chair on one more thing. So what's the one more thing that we could do to push the system um, to deliver? And there's, a, there's, a, there's quite an array, which uh, I'm happy to share with colleagues, of things that people put forward in, in a whole variety of care settings. But just to give a few examples of that, the expansion of acute respiratory hubs in primary care will make a real difference there. Whilst I think we got to a good place on the 111 call handling workforce, there's more we could do on the clinical workforce and shoring that up. The additional bed bureau capacity that we've talked about and flexibility of criteria of patients going through that service and focusing on continuous flow models of care um, and thinking about 
what the learning is from different approaches taken by different trusts. And we agreed through the Urgent Emergency Care Board six key metrics to judge success, and we're continuing to report that on a monthly basis so people are cited and can learn and share uh, from their different approaches that they're taking across the patch. So um, in, in the time I've got allotted, Chair, that hopefully gives a, a pretty good flavour of what is obviously a, a, a hugely important and hot topic at this, at this point in time. Thank you, and thank you for your leadership of this and those that you uh, work closely with and members of the board that I know this is a very difficult time. Um, questions from uh, board colleagues? No, Jacqueline. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we've learned a lot through some of the ambulance strikes, which has actually really helped um, get patients into the right place first time. And just will that be part of this, particularly around how we can input and manage the stack? Thank you very much for saying that, Jacqueline. It was it was one of the lines I chose to not mention to to respond in, a, in as timely way as I could, Chair, but um, there is a lot of learning, isn't there, from from having senior clinicians involved in, in the control room and um, some of the responses that we've, we've seen through the LAS strike, and that's something we are working with LAS to think about carefully what that means going forward for us all. Um, we're going to have more learning, aren't we, over the coming weeks as well to draw on. Um, so, but, but there's also extensive planning going on to, to manage that industrial action to the, to the best of our collective ability. But yes, absolutely, that's a key thing that the Urgent Emergency Care Board for London actually needs to look at, as well as the South West London one, is what is the learning and how we're we going to implement some of those things to make things a bit better for patients going forward. And given demand melted away, what sits beneath that, or who didn't come forward who should, but also is there learning that we could share more widely with the population about how to best access surgeon emergency care? Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Chair. Um, just briefly, I appreciate the time, but um, just to add a bit to Jonathan's uh, comments, which, which I endorse. Uh, <clears throat> I think the first thing to say is we need to be uh, mindful here that there's not a competition on who's having the toughest time here, either between providers or between sectors. So you talk to primary care, uh, their aspect, their into, input into this is as stretched and challenged as acute care. You look at community services, they're seeing it as much as the acute service are. Mental health, exactly the same thing. So let's not have a competition of, well, it's the A&E departments that are having the toughest time. Uh, that might be what sometimes the media might suggest, um, but certainly from our perspective, I think it's important as an ICB that we're clear that this is a pressure right across the system. Uh, I think the second thing to say, and we need to be clear about it, is that clearly this is having an impact on significant groups, our patients first and foremost, in terms of their experience for sure, uh, and in cases, outcomes too, and we need to be open about that and we need to make sure we are, as we are, looking at that and trying to address it, um, but it's important that we sort of own that position, and I don't think we should pass this point by without also saying the impact it has on staff. Um, uh, you know, all, many of us have worked in these systems for a long time uh, in various different places. This is as hard as I've seen it for a consistent period uh, and if you're sitting in some of those chairs doing those very frontline operational jobs, this has been an exceptionally difficult period um, and we should thank the staff for what they've done and we should continue to make sure we are supporting them. Um, and that means supporting the immediacy, and Jonathan set out, I think, a number of the things that we're doing, and there's obviously other things that we're doing every day, but we need to make sure we keep that immediate action going, but we also need to make sure we are looking ahead a little bit, because just continuing to do what we're doing in the way we're doing it, as we all know, is likely to get us a pretty similar outcome, uh, and we need it to be a different outcome to that that we're seeing at this point. So it needs to be that, and that's what's driving our work uh, across the South West London system. Thank you. John? Uh, just one question for me is how much, there was significant demand over the Christmas period, how much of that demand was potentially preventable if we'd had better uptake of um, immunisation um, amongst health and social care staff, but also the general population? And, and that's in the context of South West London is better than most places. 
but it'll be a really interesting thing because even a two or three percent reduction in attendances or admittance would have made a significant difference across the system over Christmas. Yet we we have seen falling vaccine rates this year, and that was implicit in some of the challenges that we had around Strep A, which got worse as a result of that. So. Just looking forward to next year, we have a whole host of good initiatives coming up, but just to go back to the basics, which is um, immunisation. I'll get in there before Dagmar does, I think. Thank you, uh, John. Um, so, uh, again, thank you uh, to uh, all board colleagues involved in this work, and I think just reiterate the thanks to um, colleagues across health and social care in terms of the work that they're doing uh, over winter to ensure that we continue to um, provide people who use our services with the best possible quality care that we can. Uh, is the board content to note the verbal update? Thank you. Uh, moving on to item uh, 11, which is operational planning uh, guidance. Uh, Jonathan, can, can you assume that most people have read the paper and just keep to a 30-second, 60-second uh, intro, please? Thank you. Thank you. I will take my cue from you, Chair. Um, so I, I, I'll assume people have had a chance to read it. Um, it does set out, for those of you who haven't, the national expectations for the coming uh, year. Of course, we need to add the local flavour to, to that too. Um, and I would also note the link to the joint forward plan as well. This is really the first year, 23-24 will be the first year of the five-year uh, joint forward plan. So there's a link between the sort of operational piece uh, and the longer term uh, piece. And I think I will just uh, highlight um, the, the in the cover paper the focus on core services, including those we've just been talking about. Really pleased to see the long-term plan back there in terms of some of the wider priorities around that and also the ongoing focus on transforming the NHS, which um, we're aware of through things like the Hewitt re Review. So I, I would say more. Um, I think Helen might want to add just a, a moment on the finance element, uh, but um, I've done my best to take my cue from you, Chair. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. You have indeed, Jonathan. So uh, thank you. And Helen? Oh, thank you. Acting daft there. Um, yeah, so just to, to summarise the financial position, just so that uh, people are aware, um, in the fact that uh, the way that the money is allocated down into systems changed in 22 23, so that it's on a population base, so that we get paid, um, the, we are allocated effectively um, a, an amount of money which is based on a pound per head of population, on based on the demographics. Um, this is different to historically how money has come down to individual organisations and potentially there is a d distance between the two um, and that they don't match and this creates a mismatch and we're on a journey um, to basically converge down to that population basis of, of allocation and so this will be the second year of that journey. So that in itself will therefore reduce the funding coming into the system as we go forward which is why it's really important we make sure we're as efficient as possible and as productive as possible and we make sure the money is going to the right places. Just further to add to that, that um, we, the system of allocation continues to evolve. This is not a steady state process in how it's been done. And so actually certain items are being added into the baseline, which is really helpful because we know that they're in there then. So things like COVID funding and um, things like discharge, etc., as we talked about already. So that is actually helpful in itself, but it does change the way and the methodology that's used to allocate those fundings out. And those funds are also shrinking at the same time and less is coming down into the system um, based on the agreements that have been made with Treasury for the funding to flow. So that does give us a challenge as we go forward to make sure that we can um, work to live within that envelope and it is making that challenge harder um, from where we are at this moment in time. Uh, but the key things to note are that they we're still waiting for a lot of the technical guidance to come out, so we can't confirm everything at this moment in time. Um, but what I would say is... Um, that we, we are working together as a system to try and understand that and make sure that we are counting correctly as allocations have been pulled together to make sure that we don't miss anything or double count anything um, in going through that process and that we understand the impacts of the targets that were being given. 
Um, so just two of those targets and, and then I'll come to a, a, an end. Um, the key ones to note are we do need to reduce our agency spend and we've been given a target of 3.7% as a system to do that. And, and the second target I just wanted to mention was the mental health investment standard, which would be an increase of 7% into mental health services. Thank you, Helen. Any questions? Martin. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to build on the um, Helen, your points about the the, uh, the challenging financial situation and the financial efficiency um, plans that we will need to put in place, and in parallel with that, wanting to invest in service transformation mm. and achieving strategic objectives, and the 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 operating plan guidance talks about the the digital transformation program that kind of underpins that. So, first question is. I'm, I'm assuming that the digital transformation program is important in achieving the financial efficiencies as well as achieving kind of service transformation. How, how, how is that led um, across the ICB and across the ICS and working with partner organisations and how is that coordinated? I'm going to take a couple of questions because I think John also wants to come no, in. John, John is going to answer that one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. John's sorry. going to answer that one. Uh, so, so just on the, the digital question, the answer is yes and yes. So in terms of efficiency, so there is significant investment coming into our system in terms of the EP, EPR across um, the sort of St. Helier site. But just importantly, we have reviewed all of the digital digital programs which are going on across the ICB, many are taking place in the providers. We've come up with something called a Digital Transformation Investment Plan. We have a sighting on the 113 projects that are in place and just working out which are the key ones to proceed with, making sure they're delivered within budget, um, but focusing just as much on the quality and patient's experience as they are in terms of the investment opportunities to save cash going forward. So yes is the answer to that, I think. Thank you. Jonathan. Just one brief comment, if I may. Um, uh, given that we, there's obviously a limited amount of time to have a conversation here, just to, just so board members are aware, we'll have an extended conversation in February. There's an hour planned in February, and indeed, we plan to bring an update back in March, and we may also do when well, it's formally ratified by NHS England. So I just wanted to, to flag that this is the first opportunity. There were several bites of this particular cherry. Thank you. Um, Helen, did you want to come back in again? No, I'll just, um, John is the lead for digital, um, so um, it, what he said is completely correct. I guess I would echo that thought that it is fundamental to what we do as we go forward. Maybe we, we know our workforce is our biggest constraint and therefore we need to use them as wisely as we can. And to do that, that means we need to um, use digital and, and other things to be able to, to focus them in the right places to get the best care. Sorry, on that basis, is the uh, board content to note uh, the update? Thank you. Uh, moving on to item 12 then, Integrated Care Partnership Board update. Karen. Thank you. Uh, so I'm presenting this today on behalf of Councillor Rhys Dombey, who's um, unfortunately unable to be with us through illness, so I'm sure the board will join me in wishing Ruth a speedy recovery. <coughs> uh, this report um, covers the last meeting of the Integrated Care Partnership, and just to remind us all, Integrated Care Partnership is a joint, um, a joint body between um, the NHS and local authorities, jointly convened, but actually representative of all of the organisations across South West London. One of the first things that the Integrated Care Partnership has to do is to develop a five-year strategy. So we've already talked about the NHS part called the Joint Forward Plan, um, and we've been working on that together over the last few months. Um, in your packs, there is the, the discussion document that summarises the work today and identifies a range of priorities that the partnership uh, is going out to talk to um, organisations about to whether they are the things that come, that we come together on and just to, just to let you know they are on <coughs> section four and I am just going to go through what they are because I think it's important uh, that we note those. They're going to look a little bit different in the final documents in your inboxes because one of the messages from the board was that health inequalities should become uh, one of the uh, driving areas but written differently so we've rewritten uh, the section. Um, but uh, the 
conversations that we'll be having with organisations is, uh, as we come together at scale, uh, are these the right things that we focus on? So preventing ill health, Dagmar, your point earlier, self-care and supporting people to manage their long-term conditions, to make sure that we support the health and care needs of children and young people, that we target mental health together, that we have community-based support for older and frail people. As I said, that health inequalities are tackled in everything that we do, but becomes a much more driving um, priority for us. Uh, that we um, focus on equality, diversity and inclusion, including tackling racism and discrimination. We champion collectively the Green Agenda, uh, and that we um, elevate patient care and carers and community voices. Because we can't do any of those things without workforce, we've talked about workforce in a number of the conversations we've already had today. The priority that is being pro proposed to work on together is workforce. And there are four areas, which I won't go into, but there are four areas in the discussion document where we feel that actually if we work together, we could make a real difference uh, to health and care in uh, South West London. We will be uh, writing to organisations and asking for their comments on those by the middle of March and we will use those as we go forward then to do, uh, develop delivery plans. It's important for us not only because that's the work we're going to be talking about together but as we develop the NHS's five-year plan uh, we will have to make sure that we deliver through that the, the uh, priorities set out in that plan. The, the Partnership Board also considered two other things. Uh, really interesting work that the South London Partnership, um, uh, which is the collection of South uh, West London local authorities, have developed in terms of the adult social care workforce development strategy and will bring that into that final uh, overarching workforce priority that I just talked about. And then finally it received a, an update on the Innovation Fund uh, and to remind people we had two parts to that fund. One was innovation targeted on winter resilience this year and supporting us through winter. The other was about targeting health inequalities, and, and Gloria's already mentioned that today. 250 bids across both of those um, pots of money, um, 80 successful, and lots of investment now going into NHS through both of those um, areas of investment. And we will come back as we then learn the lessons and see the impact of those to look at um, the impact and the difference that those two investment pots have made. Thank you, Karen. Any questions on that update? Thanks, Chair. It's not really a question, it's just an observation to support the point about whatever we end up agreeing, <clears throat> and I suspect there'll be little in those priorities that people are going to mm. disagree with. The really important thing is that we then turn that into action, and in particular, as far as today's meeting is concerned, <coughs> You know, this board has regard to them in all of the decisions that it makes, either about priorities or, yeah. or resources. Um, and that was very much the um, emphasis of the, of the conversation at the partnership and has been elsewhere. It's about turning it into practical action, particularly about decision making around resources and priorities. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Sarah. So I think that's really important. I also think that's important for local authorities as well, because what we will be doing is saying as a partnership, we all commit to that and how are we going to reflect this in all of our plans. So I think it will be important for everyone. This is the opportunity, though, for all the organisations in the system to feed back on this so that when we finalise the delivery plans that we can all um, we can all feed them into all of our plans that we do, both in local authorities and all the other organisations that are part of the partnership. So I think it will be key that people have the opportunity to feed back on these priorities. Thank you. Dick. Um, well, first, first of all, I really welcome this update and, and that actually the, the detail and the focus and the, the way in which you've actually brought together a whole series of different ways of analysing what priorities should be uh, to produce something that's actually pretty crisp because, of course, that's one of the risks of these 87 priorities being nothing will happen. Um, and I think that's a great foundation. Um, I, I think uh, there are two further things I, I, I want to say. Though it, it seems to me this is the absolute heart of what this board should be talking about, uh, as well as the partnership. And, and I think there's a real concern for us that um, it's maybe a generic truth about public sector, public documents that call themselves strategies. Um, it's very hard to focus down on, yes, and how are we really going to do that, given that the world isn't going to give us all the money and time and resource that we want. And that's a big risk, it seems to me, because the, the risk is that we will have 
surface level engagement with this and, and actually we need some pretty fundamental system level en engagement and, and that isn't something that's easy to do because every individual institution has its own pressures. So I'm interested in the how and it seems to me that the how we deliver, as, as Mike just said, um, needs to be built in and, and I one thing I'd like to suggest, and I'll give an example, but I don't think I'm the person to give the precise examples, is we need, we need to develop much better infrastructure for collaboration. Um, because otherwise, each institution will use you know, the 1% spare it happens to have in resource right now, rather than really engaging at a deeper level. So my, my example of that, I think workforce might be a place it's good that there's a lot of logic that, to that being a priority straight away. Think about how we might construct career paths across local government and the, and the health service. But that will rapidly run into things that are done and, or decided at national level. And therefore, there are big judgments about how much push would, would we and partner institutions be willing to put in, into changing some of those rules or pushing for change. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one I'd just like to list, which it seems to me is important to several of the discussions about transformation we've had before, is, is how we think about finance across institutions. Um, so this is an example, and there may be lots of reasons why I'm technically wrong, but we don't have a health, we, well, I'd suggest we should aspire to have a health pound, to have a real sense of spending a pound on this sort of person is best done in this place. And we're, we're not set up to do that right now across local government and, and the NHS, or even, I suspect, across different parts of the NHS. And yet, something like that is absolutely essential to making a financial case for big transformation. Now, I give that as an example. I, I, uh, others in this room will know much better what those best bits of collaborative in infrastructure are. But it does seem to me that if we don't build into this strategy early on an agreement to make the effort to have the kit with which we know that different institutions can afford financially to really commit, that we'll end up with quite a surface level set of things. Um, that'll be more pressure on, on comms to make it look good, but, but we will know we could have done better. So I, I, I suggest we should, we should think about what that infrastructure might be and others here will know much better what the answer might be. Thank you, Dick. Um, Karen, shall I ask you to mm. come back on that? I don't see any other questions or comments from board members. Okay. Uh, so I think they're really good suggestions. I suppose the thing to remember is we're just still new at this, aren't we? Because we've only just been going. So, But it does feel like a very important conversation that we're going to have to have with the Integrated Care Partnership together. Um, I think there is something about how do you make delivery happen and how do you make sure it's the right level and it's doing the right things. Um, and we will have to take back, I think, uh, costed delivery plans that will then show how we're actually going to achieve that. But your point is wider than that, I think, mm -hmm. uh, Dick, which I'll take back and we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and I think it will, it will take investment and resource from a multitude of organisations across South West London. One of the things that has been very clear to us in the conversations when we were creating the Integrated Care Partnership and since actually on the, for the board members is let's do a small amount of things that are resourced well that deliver and try and do everything actually because we won't achieve as much as we could. Um, but I think, they're, I think they're wise words but I don't necessarily have an immediate answer for them. Um, I think though one of the things I would just... Um, kind of highlight again is the reason that we've created both of the investment fund and the inequalities funds in the way that we did was to begin to try and do that and certainly in the future the idea about the investment part of that is it would be focused on the delivery of those ICP priorities so to try and begin to resource but I think we need to have a, a more longer thought about that. Thank you. Um, is the board content to uh, note the report and update on Karen? Moving on to item 13, so we've got three uh, ICB uh, reports. Could I ask uh, Gloria to um, come in on the uh, first report from the quality team? 
Thank you. And I'll assume that everybody has read this report. I'm just going to draw our attention to key issues uh, that we are dealing with in the system. Um, the first thing is around the strike, and it's not just nurses across the whole piece. And we're going to have um, teachers and so on going on strike as well. So it's not just it's not going to be just the pressure of winter. It's going to be pressure of workforce that we're going to be dealing with in the next few months. Also, as to say, from clinical point of view, one of the um, wicked issue for us is CHC, and we've got few issues across the system around that. We are working through that. We have pre presented comprehensive um, reports to the Quality and Oversight Committee, and we have also commissioned an independent investigation to some of the cases that we are reviewing, and also another independent provider to actually look at look future model of care so that we can build sustainability and all the issues we identify now can be mitigated and prevented in case of the future. And finally, I just want to talk about metrics because we mentioned that in the last November board, and I know there was challenges around metrics in, in the last board. We, are, we went back and we consulted with people at the System Quality Council. The System Quality Council asked almost everybody in the system in that, including our external partners so, such as CQC, GMC, HEE in that. So we consulted with them to say, look, what would be ID metrics to actually sort of like bring to the board for the ICD to have an oversight on. The teams that came out of that are three key things. They still want, I know workforce sits in another portfolio, but they, they feel that strong link, like what we've been discussing around quality and workforce, and they want workforce to be um, monitored in terms of how we deliver quality of care across the system. Mental health came out loud as well as one of the areas they want us to focus on. And finally, safer care in terms of incident monitoring and safety. So what we've done then in page 136 is to probably put that on the table and look at the life continuum in, and attaching that and aligning that to our um, ICS um, strategy in terms of the um, born well, start well, live well, feel well, and age well. And we'll pick some metrics and not, um, that is, that man, not just health, looking at local authority metrics as well and social care metrics in that. So this example of the metrics we've picked, but we're going to be working with it and see how it works. We can test it all out and then probably bring what the final matrix is through the oversight and quality and oversight committee. And, and I'm hoping that in the future, one of the ICB seminars, we can bring our dashboard and showcase our dashboard there for us to have more compressive discussion around metrics. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Gloria? I think if people have got feedback on the metrics, it would be really good if they could send those through mm -hmm. to Gloria so that that can feed into the further development of this work through the uh, policy board. I'm sorry, just um, on page 134, just around the send uh, outcomes, just to, to confirm that actually Merton has also now received a notification that it has made sufficient progress. Excellent. Thank you for that update. No further questions on that basis. Is the uh, board content to note the report? Thank you. So, uh, performance report. Uh, Jonathan, can I ask you to uh, introduce this? Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. So, again, um, I will take the report as read and just highlight those areas of good news and progress and also um, areas of uh, ongoing and significant challenge. So in the uh, good news camp, um, continuing to make progress on uh, long waiters for the reporting period, which is the uh, back end of last year and stable with the overall number of people who are waiting uh, 52 weeks or more. So um, a good performance, particularly in the context of the challenges we talked about around urgent emergency care. Uh, a little earlier. Um, against the 62-day standard, um, delivering the highest performance in London again now, so that is good to see. Recovery in the A&E waiting time position from um, uh, some of the challenges seen previously for the reporting period, which is uh, November in, in comparison with the rest of London, but again, of course, a long way from where we would like it to be. 
we're starting to see an uptick against our performance against the diagnostic standards. So that's um, uh, good to see up to 83% against the 95% standard <laughs> and early intervention in psychosis after going through a rather tricky period earlier in the year, again recovering back towards standards. So those are areas of um, uh, progress from, from my perspective I want to draw out. Areas of challenge, um, we've talked about this at length, so uh, just to give a, a brief snapshot, that obviously there's the pressures around ambulance handover that we talked about earlier, but also 12-hour waits for patients in emergency departments, or 1,900 people waited in November. We, yeah. We're literally used to a handful at most. That's the fifth highest of, of, of the ICESs uh, nationally. Our faster diagnostic standard for cancer, so that, that's about telling people whether they do or don't have cancer in a very timely way. Again, we're challenged on that metric. Um, uh, we're now uh, the second from uh, last in London. We were in the last in London in this reporting period, and that's particularly uh, uh, resonant for, for challenges faced around breast services and some lower GI services across, uh, lower gastrointestinal path services across the uh, uh, system. Um, a challenge that we seek to incre increase productivity um, and some of the conversations we had earlier, our waiting list for access to planned care has grown by 20% since the, since the pandemic. Um, that's tens of thousands of additional people waiting. That is a significant um, challenge for us. And I'd also call out the virtual ward element <laughs> where, as I touched on earlier, there's uh, a lot of work going on. There are some data quality issues as these are new services being established um, too. But we obviously want to optimise those services and make the very best use of them through uh, this winter and, and, and going forward. So we're, we're doing more work in that area too. So hopefully, Chair, yeah, that's a balance of good news and less, less good news. Thank you. Mercy, anything to add on this report? Um, obviously, at the QOC, we, we looked in quite a lot of detail at this. So I'm looking at particularly trends and, and things. I'm understanding the, the pressures in the system uh, too, but obviously closely looking at um, any, any glimmers of hope, as um, Jonathan was saying, but also what we're trying to do um, to, to get back into kind of uh, um, better kind of better levels of care. Thank you. Um, any questions from members of the board? Sarah. Can I, can I just pick up this CYP access rate for mental health services? Because that looks like the target is pretty high in comparison to the, the level that we are seeing. Do we understand that? I suppose like that might be for Vanessa rather than Jonathan. So apparently Karen knows the answer. Karen? So I, I well, just, Vanessa's just having a look at it. Okay. <laughs> I just got an update from Tonya on this yesterday um, when I was just rereading the pack. So, so the, the, the target has changed. So it used to be two indicators, it's now one, and actually that shows a deterioration in our performance because of that. Uh, we have seen increased demand. We know we've got the whole schools approach in things uh, in, a, in our schools now, therefore we're seeing demand increase, which is a good thing, but actually then does affect our ability to deliver that. Uh, and therefore we need to do some more work to make sure that we can actually meet that demand. Vanessa, anything you want to add? I think the only thing I'd add in addition to that is a significant challenge we have around some fragmentation in our pathways, which we're working on through the mental health strategy, and also the challenge we have around recruitment and retention. But you'll see that you're, uh, Karen mm. ably summarised the, uh, the changes in the target. Thank you. Jonathan. So just wanted to sort of reflect on that point. I think it relates... Uh, of course, it relates to all areas, actually, of what we provide in terms of services, but it's particularly pertinent to a number of the mental health indicators, that the workforce challenges that are driving, and we received an update, didn't we, at the board earlier in th this year around children and young people's services, but some of the workforce challenges that sit around that, but not only that, some of the other areas we're working on here, uh, psychological therapies being another obvious service, but also acute and community um, mental health services more generally drives a lot of this. So I think being thoughtful, creative, 
challenging ourselves about the workforce is going to be a key part of finding a way out of uh, out of where we are on some of these indicators. Thank you, Karen. So, so just to say, Jonathan, I met with the mental health team this week to talk about that because actually I was talking about the integrated care partnership and the four priorities for workforce. So one of them is around across our system in health and social care, where are our where are really difficult to recruit to posts and actually if we took a system approach and a different approach could we make a difference so i was particularly talking to them about the vacancies in mental health and whether they were some of those that we would target um, and the second one um out of what well, two out of those four is around the the workforce design of the future and actually if we know that we've got roles that are incredibly difficult to recruit to and actually we have limited success are they the right roles going forward? So I talked to both. I talked to the mental health teams about those, and we'll talk about it in the uh, provider uh, board as well. Thank you, Matthew. Yeah, thanks. Just a very quick uh, addition on the performance piece, which is on diagnostics. I mean, Jonathan's referenced it uh, a bit in terms of some of the improvements. It's a very movable feast. This week alone, we've had two separate uh, communications centrally um, uh, offering potential additional uh, resources to help with diagnostic reductions in weights for the year end. Um, I suspect there may be a little bit more of that as we go through from now to the end of March. So just worth uh, board members being aware that that is something that we started to see appearing. Uh, obviously I'll be sharing that with uh, colleagues. I can see Jacqueline's looking interested um, uh, uh, for a whole host of reasons um, uh, and I think it's it's looking a little bit more helpful in that regard but we'll, we'll wait and see how, how those things play out. Thank you. Any further questions? On that basis uh, are board members content to note the report? Thank you. Um, and then finally uh, over to Helen in terms of uh, the finance report. Thank you, Chair. I will also take the paper as read and just pull out some of the key highlights. So just to confirm that um, we had a £60 million deficit um, at month eight, um, which is £18 million of burst from plan. And um, of that, about um, £15 million of it related to undelivered savings. So you can see the majority of it relates to um, where the savings are coming from. Those savings in the main were around pay savings. Um, as you can see, our pay costs are continuing to increase and our agency costs are continuing to increase. But it comes back to the challenges for the workforce being to be able to find um, specific um, people for roles to cover things, mm -hmm. to cover the level of sickness that we've had within the workforce, which has remained extremely high, and also yeah. around the challenges we face during winter and the demand that is being put upon us as a system and the additional um, capacity that we've had to open up as we go forward. So you can see the story all coming out yeah. within the finances there. Um, as we go forward for the rest of the year, we continue to be challenged by the delivery of our savings programme and being able to um, fund the inflationary pressures that we have as we go forward. So that is going to be a challenge on us, being able to deliver our financial position. And we continue to work with NHS England around that and what does that mean and how do we go forward um, on this. Uh, just to add that we have received the additional funds for the discharge um, that have come down and obviously those are within here but, but it's an equal and opposite of we're receiving it and then spending it to ensure that we can do the best for the local population um, and to note that our, the capital allocations that we receive for the trusts are online to be spent for the year. Thank you. Um, Dick, anything you'd like to add to that? Really, just to, to re reiterate on, on the agency issue, it, it shows mm -hmm. the real importance of that priority mm -hmm. that, that the ICP will be looking at, because we clearly need new tools if we're going to yeah. going to address the, the, the workforce problem. And uh, just to be a stuck record from last time, the scale of the issue of, of um, other savings does raise that question of are we equipped for transformation, which we really need across the system if we're to get out of this financial problem? We're going to have to do something more, more dramatic than just squeeze productivity. Thank you. Uh, Dick, any questions uh, from the board? Nicola. Thank you. Um, could I just ask about the primary care figures on here? Just kind of getting used to looking at the report. So does the primary care um, figures quoted uh, include prescribing? 
Oh, sorry, thank you. I think the prescribing budget is that in the place budget. I need to check where prescribing thank is that. Okay, just I can come back to you on that, Nicola. Thank you. Any other questions? Sarah, if you want. More of a comment. Um, so this year, financially, has been really difficult for South West London. This is probably one of the most difficult years I think I've experienced um, since I've been in South West London anyway on the finances. We are not going to achieve a balanced budget at the end of the year, that's really clear. That has an impact on us for next year and also our allocation for next year is lower than some others. So we have a lower allocation in comparison to the national. So we have a kind of double whammy really of um, not, not achieving this year, which we will now have to make up and having less money than others. And you know, I would argue that um, the money that others have got is probably still not enough anyway. So, um, so we are gonna have to do some significant change, I think, in order to meet the financial targets that we will have. Um, there will be a lot of pressure on us over the next 12 months. So the, the pressure for the remaining part of this year, although it's really difficult, I think, to influence the rest of this year now. I mean, we are almost in February now. Um, but next year, I think, you know, we are, we are, we are going to have to do some quite significant things. I don't want to underestimate that. Um, and I think, you know, I do point it out at every board meeting, but I, you know, it is not getting any better, I think is my kind of message. And we, it's going to be difficult and we are going to have to make some really difficult decisions, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Important to note. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. On that basis, then, are we content to uh, note the report? Thank you. Moving on to item 13. Uh, so there's items for information only and not for discussion. So there's uh, a vaccination <coughs> update, uh, update and then committee updates from Finance and Planning Committee, Quality and Oversight Committee, Audit and Risk Committee. Um, so again, information only and not for further discussion. Moving on to item 14, uh, so questions from um, Simon and Alyssa from the Voluntary Sector and Health Watch. Simon, can I come to you first with questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, if it's OK, I'd like to just give a brief update on um, work at South West London BCS level uh, around the uh, Voluntary Sector Alliance. Um, so the ICB provided some funding um, for a post to support development of interaction between the voluntary sector and the ICS, ICB. Um, so that work's continuing. The, I think interviewing for the post is taking place, I think, next week. Um, and then in addition to that, um, there is a little bit of capacity for development um, of understanding around BCS at place level. So there'll be workshops going on, which will be doing two things really. One, helping people understand um, what the ICS is, what the opportunities are, um, but also um, helping them understand more what, what the, the voluntary sector alliance is and what it might do um, and get the, getting their engagement. So just to kind of um, give assurance of that, that work is, is kind of continuing. Um, and then just in terms of questions, I only have one. Um, it's really great to hear all of the work around um, the equality delivery system. It's great to see that focused on maternity. Um, but my question was, um, and I, I know there's a self-assessment and, and also there's lots of data collected, but will there be a specific piece of work to benchmark um, the effects of that equality programme, as in, you know, some of that kind of really hard data um, to, to see actually if it is really making a difference at the... Um, service to the end. Gloria, can I come to you? So is the yes. <laughs> and, and sorry, I should have asked, and, and where will that be, where will that data go? Will it come here or will it go to a, a subgroup, subboard, or subcommittee? So there is a um, local maternity and unitary system a group. That is where the data will go first, and they will then report through the quality and oversight committee that Mercy share is a subcommittee of this board. And anything that is, we need to escalate here, we'll, we'll bring it here. Thank you, Gloria and Simon. Um, and thank you for the update on the work as well, Simon. Alyssa. Thanks, Chair. I also have a question for Gloria. It's in reference to agenda 
item 13. There's reference to the creation of a system patient experience panel. I was just wondering if you can speak a little bit about the membership of the panel, what it's trying to achieve, and also how it differs from the existing citizens panel. Thank you. Thank you. So we've done a lot of work around patient engagements across Southwest London, and obviously Charlotte has done so, so much work around that with other partners. But what we want to get into is to probably looking at more deeply into patient experience. Each organization has strategy and they have work that they do around patient experience. But what we want to do is, again, like, like patient safety, how do we bring that together in terms of improving and learning across the piece? So that's one of the roles of, of, roles of the patient safety and um, patient experience panel. But more importantly, is around complaints. And one of the things we found out is that we have complaints that comes to the ICS, even including the organization <coughs> complaints. Um, what we found that, especially with the ICS complaints that comes in, we send the response through, and we tell people that we're going to do A, A Y, and B, but then there is nowhere we actually monitor the delivery of those actions, or probably things that we can measure in terms of impact that this is making. Again, this is a forum where those kind of things will be challenged and we'll be able to monitor and have an oversight across the system. So it's mainly really improving patient experience and also improving outcome. We're working with our other partners across the system. Thanks very much, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. I just had uh, one other, uh, really a, a suggestion, but I'll phrase it as a question. Um, looking through the, the some of the metrics that were reported today. I was wondering if we can make it maybe consider routinely presenting patient outcome and patient experience metrics disaggregated by uh, certain protected characteristics. So for example, if we're looking at 52 week times, waiting times, um, if we could consider seeing that data, for example, by white and non-white patients. Um, I just think that that kind of reporting would be really helpful in terms of making sure that this board is aligned with its commitments to um, addressing inequalities. Speaking as Health Watch, um, it's really helpful to have this sort of data as it informs our own uh, qualitative research priorities and enables us to dig a little bit deeper into seeing, uh, to working with patients into how we might address those. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask Jonathan to come back on that question? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really important point and something that uh, Gloria and I are, are thinking through at the moment together with colleagues from the Acute Provider Collaborative around waiting list data, for example, and uh, health inequalities. So I think there is further to go in that. Um, I, would, I would flag that we tried to be quite tight in the number of metrics that we bring to this board and to keep them in the sort of low, low 30s. And uh, that doesn't mean that board subcommittees and other reports that we wouldn't share wouldn't provide some of the degree of detail that we were looking at. So, for example, through the Quality and Oversight Committee that Mercy chairs, that would be an obvious place to bring some of the key information around um, health inequalities and waiting lists, which was, which was part of your uh, question, I think. So, um, happy to perhaps talk outside of here about finding the right balance, um, uh, but I am I think it's important to ensure that that we keep a real focus on 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 the most high level series of metrics um, too, as well as ensuring that that's embedded with through the um, the, the board subcommittee structure that does give importance and give some clarity around some really important things, such as the, the issues you're you're addressing. I would say there's also a wider challenge actually around it. It's a fairly new area for us to look at um, around. Uh, inequalities in waiting lists, so there are issues there. We have done a lot of work on cancer, particularly cancer waiting lists, and what that looks like by a different ethnic group and uh, by other core 20 plus 5 characteristics. So we've, we have done some work um, in, mm -hmm. in, in that space too. And it also, I'd layer my earlier point over that the overall waiting list is growing, so um, that of itself presents a significant challenge to us all, as well as the health inequalities within it. Hopefully that's at least partial answer to your question. It is, thank you. I think Sarah wants to come in as yeah. well as Gloria. So actually we have got some work, which I know that Gloria presented to my senior management team uh, a few weeks ago around the uh, makeup of waiting lists. 
Um, I think I think the most important thing for us, when we, I mean, and I'll bring Gloria in to say what that told us. Um, I think the most important thing is actually people that aren't accessing waiting lists, and whether or not actually we have a bigger problem not with people when they're on the waiting list, but are they actually getting onto a waiting list in the first place? And that appears to be the issue. I'm sure Gloria will be able to say something about the the depth of that, but. Just because we don't have it here doesn't necessarily mean we won't be able to share it with Healthwatch. So I'm wondering whether or not we have a discussion with you outside where we, where if there is data that you would find useful, that we could share that with you. Um, we would check whether or not that's okay to share because you know there are, there are issues sometimes around data sharing. But if, as long as it's okay to share that with you, I think that we could share that information with you outside of this board because we can't bring everything to the board. But I think if there's specific information, we could work with you on that. Can I ask Gloria just to what that, that told us? Because I think yes. it's important. Thank you, um, Sarah. So in, in terms of the waiting list there, uh, we, we did cut that across few protective characteristics, including learning disability, not just race alone. So again, we can probably just show you that out of here. And like Sarah has rightly said, it didn't really show that when people get to the waiting list, they are being delayed. It, it, there's no really discrepancies in terms of that, or wide gaps. I think where we are worried about is actually people are assessing the services and actually getting to the waiting list. And I think that's where we need to work with various communities. I think that's what that was, that was tell, telling us. And that work, we, we are taking it to the, um, to the Health Inequalities Board, and it will come to the Quality and Oversight Committee as well, in terms of how we sort of like progress on that. And also the UEC... Yeah, the Urgent Emergency Care Board, yes. Yes, an emergency care board in terms of oversight on that. But what I want to say is that I think what you are saying is really crucial. And when we agree on what comes in terms of metrics to the board, I think we can use population health management lens, which will include some of the things you are saying in terms of dealing with how do we look at target, not just performance and target or quality, but how does that affect our local population and looking at protective characteristics. But I want to put a word of, a word of caution. One of the problems we have is data, the, the, um, data collection and data quality. I'll tell you now, data around those things are very difficult to get. It's not, the quality of it is not that great, so we don't get good enough data. And in the health inequalities board, that's one of our priorities to actually improve that collection of those data in terms of protective characteristics. Thank you, uh, Gloria. Um, so, uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Simon and Alyssa. I'm now going to move on to any other business. Amazingly, we seem to have <laughs> got ahead of ourselves. Um, from behind, from behind uh, indeed. Um, so, on that basis, I am going to uh, close uh, the uh, meeting and take public questions. So um, I have had uh, two written questions. I believe uh, that we've got Ael Gelbert in the audience as well. So I'll just cover the first written question where I haven't got um, uh, a member. In I don't think, have I got Christopher Cole in the audience? No. Okay. So I will uh, cover that question. Uh, I'll then come to you. When do you flag that you want to come in? Can I check whether there is any other questions from member of the public? Thank you. Um, so uh, we've received a detail detailed question from Mr. Christopher Cole regarding training opportunities for allied health professionals within providers. Um, and what I've asked Karen to do, I think there's quite a lot of um, information mm -hmm. to cover here. So I've asked Karen to go back uh, to Mr. Cole in terms of um, uh, being able to provide uh, a comprehensive response on the questions that have been asked. Um, could I now come to um, Isle to ask his question, please? Let's give you a microphone so everyone can Thank hear. Thank you very much, so you can hear me better. My name is Ayal Gelbat. I'm the chair of the local optical committee for Merton, Sutton and Wandsworth. And I am... Um, just uh, noted from the uh, operational planning guidance that you just uh, uh, ran through at page 97 that uh, the contract for pharmacy, ophthalmology, actually it's optometry and industry should be fully delegated to the ISB by April 23. 
I just wonder if this be an opportunity for the LOC to discuss it with the ICB, uh, as the LOC is the statutory primary care body that represents optical practices. So that's the first question. Thank you. Mark, I think you're going to respond to this one, is that correct? I am. Um, so uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, we do know that dental, optometry and pharmacy, uh, the delegation is happening at pace, so we haven't had lots of time to actually prepare for this. Uh, but I do have uh, meetings with uh, South West London representatives in all three areas in the next two weeks. Uh, what we do know is that the delegation uh, will happen on the 1st of April and North East London will post it on behalf of all five London ICBs, but we're currently working through a kind of memo of understanding what does that actually mean in reality and how do we locally influence and work alongside North East London and I'll happily have conversations outside with you. Uh, uh, yeah. The next question, if I may, um, I know the emphasis of reaching out to how to reach groups of patients. So Saturn has a patients with learning disability scheme uh, that give extra time for patients with learning disability to have their eye test because they do have um, 10 times more eye problems than the normal population. I wonder if the uh, ICB will consider extending this service across the ICS currently is only commissioned in Saturn. Mark, I think that's for you again. Yeah, so just to say that this is a locally commissioned service in Sutton based on kind of assessment of need around their learning disabilities uh, patients. So what we've asked Sutton to do is share that with all boroughs. Uh, our liaise uh, also with our South West London colleagues, Tonya, around learning disabilities. And just to note that in terms of ophthalmology services, they're not delegated until the 1st of April. So we've got some time to kind of work that through. Thank you. Um, one more. Okay, thank you. All, all, always open for questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. One more, final one. Um, I just um, noted that the South West London Ophthalmology Network has uh, submitted a business case for post-cataract assessment in optical practices about a year ago. And basically, that will be free up some appointment in the secondary care to um, consider the other things. Uh, so far, the ICB or the ICS hasn't um, approved it or hasn't approved it. I wonder if there's any... Uh, if you can update us about the progress of that business case, please. Thank you. And that's the final one. Thank you very much. I think Mark's jumping in. As so I think this is a, a, it's a submitted uh, individual business case about a particular area. So it's probably not appropriate for us to respond to that. But I can uh, have a conversation with you outside and we can track where the progress is. Thank you. Wendy, could I ask you for your question? Um, I think I introduced myself um, in November and um, I mentioned something that was very pressing to me which is the fact that from the Freedom of Information Act request that we've received over the last four years it appears that electroconvulsive treatment is in fact a sexist treatment and um, many people consider it should stop now. Um, I heard no mention of it. Um, I'm sorry I, I can't read these committee papers. They're, they're very long and very difficult for someone um, to read. Um, so I, um, and I talked to Vanessa in the break and hopefully um, South West London St George's will provide the data that we requested last April for 2021. So um, after the meeting I actually prepared my own notes and I asked them to be distributed to all of you. It's only a page and a bit long. Um, and um, unfortunately that didn't happen, but I think um, I've got Ben's contact, so I'll write up this meeting and hopefully you'll all have a look at it. Um, the points about it is um, to move away from medical model of distress to human rights model of distress. So in that brief set of information that I uh, hoped that you'd all received, it talks about, um, it talks about housing as a major issue with regards to mental health. It talks about poverty as a major issue with regards to mental health and many other ideas. It talks about universal basic income, which is already happening in Wales. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but in um, Italy, um, mental health wards in some regions have been closed um, by a very enlightened psychiatrist, and that's been happening for many years. Um, uh, also, people assemblies, I think, and participatory budgeting, which happens in France. 
Um, to give you a bit of background information, the World Health Organization calls for radical change within the mental health system, and they quote our work as best practice. Uh, I'm involved with a small community group that gets no funding whatsoever. I'm not looking for funding. I don't, I don't want to be um, obligated to anyone. But um, you, you could really learn from us. Um, and I think it's important that you actually listen to what we're saying, because I've been coming to these meetings for about 10 years now, and I've been raising the issue about human rights within the mental health system for that length of time, and I see no change. And the people that I talk to see no change. People are still being restrained for refusing medications. People are still being sectioned repeatedly who come from minority groups. It's just not good enough. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing those um, observations. Vanessa. Um, yeah, so I echo thanks, Wendy, for your continued commitment to raise the importance of mental health on the agenda. Um, I think there are some things within um, your statements, that, um, uh, particularly around ECT, that would be useful for us to have a discussion about um, to make sure that it's accurately reported, and I'll ensure that an accurate report <coughs> gets circulated to the board members around um, ECT, and I'll also circulate that to yourself so you see that what, what is um, being said. I know that you're um, actively engaged in the mental health strategy development for South West London and would really encourage you to continue to, to be so um, in relation to reducing restrictive practices across both um, uh, Mental Health Act, Mental Capacity Act and um, restraints. We have got active work that's reported on through um, our board reports, um, which I know that you engage with. If, if you are struggling from an access accessibility perspective around um, our, our reporting structures, then I know both myself and Charlotte would be happy to, to think with you about how we make those more accessible to, to you and to other people. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, and on that basis, I'm going to draw the meeting uh, to a close. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Wendy, I think we've... Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And on that basis, I'm going to close the meeting. Thank you.